The 50 and Better Health Fair program will begin in five minutes.
The program will begin in one minute. Welcome to the 2020 50 and Better Health Fair. It is now our pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Paul Volker and Olivia Matz, president of DMU's Geriatrics Club. Hello, and welcome to Des Moines University's virtual 50 and Better Healthcare event. My name is Dr. Paul Volker. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Family and Internal Medicine and a geriatrician in Des Moines University's clinic. Hi, my name is Olivia Matz and I'm a second year medical student here at Des Moines University. I am also the president of the Geriatrics Club. Every year, the Geriatrics Club puts together the 50 and Better Fair. Due to the COVID pandemic, we are unable to join you physically, but we are thrilled that you're able to join us virtually this year. The students and faculty have put together great presentations to allow you to live your healthiest and happiest lives. Throughout the fair today, we have pre-scheduled breaks to allow you to get up, stretch your legs, and even go grab a mid-morning snack. You might recognize that where I'm standing is normally where we'd greet you for Des Moines University's 50 and Better Health Fair. You'd be offered a cup of coffee and something good to eat while you took part in what we have to offer. Well, in pandemic times, that's not possible, but we hope that you'll be able to enjoy our offerings this morning at home with your own beverage and breakfast. During this pandemic time, it's never been more important to take care of your own health. We hope that this morning you'll be able to pick up some pointers and come out of this pandemic better than ever. As I said earlier, I'm board certified in family medicine and in geriatric medicine, which means that I specialize in patients who are aged 50 and older. All of the departments at the Des Moines University clinics, including physical therapy, osteopathic medicine, and podiatric medicine, have specialists who work with the geriatrics patients. We hope you'll come and visit us at 3200 Grand Avenue on the Des Moines University campus, and we have telehealth visits available for those of you who can't or shouldn't come in in person. Make sure to grab your pen and notebook or your virtual notebook to write down any comments or questions you might have throughout the fair. You can submit those questions to the email listed below in the yellow box, questions at dmu.edu, and we will be sure to answer them at the, end of the at the end of the fair at the question and answer session or answer them personally via email. Thank you so much for attending the first ever virtual 50 and Better Fair that we've created especially for you. Thank you for visiting us at Des Moines University's first virtual 50 and Better Healthcare Fair. Hello, my name is Karis Kassler, and I am here talking to you today on behalf of Des Moines University's Sigma Sigma Phi Honors Fraternity. Today, I would like to discuss with you the science of maintaining positive mental health goals in this talk on how to stay happy and healthy. The first thing I wanna talk about is what mental illness looks like by discussing two common mental illnesses. Firstly, depression is a condition that most people think means that you're always sad, but the reality is that it encompasses so much more than that. Depression can mean that you are excessively tired, you're not sleeping well, or you're feeling irritable without really understanding why. Depression could also feel like confusion, trouble focusing, or no longer enjoying things that you used to enjoy. That could include playing games, going on walks, being with friends and family, watching your favorite TV show or listening to music, or even everyday activities like cooking. Sometimes depression can cause you to eat less or eat more than you usually would. You may cry a lot more than you used to. Depression can also mean having thoughts of ending your life, 
whether that's having a definite plan or feeling like it would be okay if you weren't around. Depression can also cause physical symptoms like headaches, muscle aches, and digestive troubles. Secondly, anxiety is defined as excessive nervousness, fear, or worrying. Everyone worries sometimes, but if your worrying is causing you to fear leaving your house, being around your support system, or constantly thinking about traumatic events, it becomes anxiety. Anxiety, like depression, can also have physical symptoms like chest pains, headaches, sweating, and digestive distress. So now that we know what mental illness looks like, what causes it? The simple answer is that we don't have a simple answer for that. Conditions like depression and anxiety are multifactorial, meaning that oftentimes there's more than one cause. For depression, if you have a family history or a personal history of depression, you're at an increased risk for developing depression as an older adult. If you experience a stressful event in your life, like the loss of a loved one, a difficult relationship, or physical isolation associated with COVID-19, these events can increase your risk for depression. Additionally, some people just have different levels of hormones in the brain, meaning that depression originates at the chemical level. With anxiety, if you concurrently have a physical illness like COPD, cardiovascular disease, thyroid disease, or diabetes, just to name a few, this can lead to excessive worrying over physical health symptoms that can increase your risk for developing anxiety. Additionally, medications that are used to treat these conditions can have anxiety as a side effect. If you're not sleeping properly or have physical limitations to your daily activities, this can also increase your risk for anxiety. Similarly to depression, stressful or negative events from childhood or adulthood, like living during a pandemic, can contribute to the risk of developing anxiety disorders. All of that being said, the most important thing to take away from this talk is that if you are experiencing any of those feelings or symptoms, you are not alone in what you're feeling. You are not weak because of what you're feeling, and there are ways to work through what you are experiencing. Because of the societal stigma surrounding mental health, anxiety and depression are underdiagnosed and undertreated. This phenomenon is seen in all age groups, but it's particularly pronounced in people over the age of 55. Depression is found in 1-5% to of the population over 55, and anxiety is seen in 3-14% to of the population over the age of 55. Depression and anxiety are not normal parts of aging, but they are not uncommon in aging adults. So if you take away one thing from this talk today, I hope it's that you hear that you are not alone. The good news is that there are things that you can do to actively improve your anxiety and depression symptoms if these are things that you're experiencing. The first thing that will have a positive impact on mental health is social involvement. Seniors on the Move is a program that has monthly or yearly subscriptions available for you to have access to lifestyle planning, weekly events, community outreach, lifeline screening, and medical coverage for vision and dental. Visiting Angels is a personal home care service that can com provide companionship and daily activity assistance without a prescription for home health care. Both of these programs are ways to facilitate social interaction, especially in times when that can be difficult to come by. Next, nutrition has an incredible impact on our mental health, so it's important to make sure that you are maintaining a well-balanced diet. You should definitely consult your physician about a dietary plan that is best for you, but focusing on eating fruits and veggies, lean proteins like fish or chicken, whole grains, and low-fat dairy are the staples of a well-balanced diet. Shopping can be really challenging during these COVID-19 times, but there are options available specifically for vulnerable populations. Hy-Vee, Walmart, and Target have pickup and delivery options for groceries where they load groceries into your car for you to make it safer. Instacart is another really great service available where you can have food delivered directly to your door from Aldi, CVS, Sam's Club, and Costco. You can also have groceries delivered from Whole Foods by using Amazon. If you would rather still do your own shopping, there are also options specifically for vulnerable populations, like at Price Chopper, Walmart, and Target at the hours that are listed here on the slide. These options all make it possible to stay safe, but make sure that you are eating a well-balanced diet that can positively impact your mental health. 
It's also important to note that medical professionals are here to help you with mental health concerns. Whether you feel more comfortable talking in person or through a virtual appointment, there are options available to you within the medical community. Talking with physicians about how you have been feeling and seeing if maybe starting a medication to help with your mental health could be very beneficial. Your physician may also consider other physical concerns that could be negatively affecting your mental health, like chronic fatigue, chronic pain, or gastrointestinal concerns, and they could talk to you about options available to improve those physical concerns. Talking to a therapist is also an option available to you that can help you to express your feelings in a controlled setting where you can learn to know that your feelings are being heard and that your feelings are valid. Emotional expression is always important, but especially so when we're talking about maintaining positive mental health. Talking about what you are experiencing is helpful for you, but it is also helpful for those around you who love you and care for you and want to understand what you've been struggling with. In order to feel healthy emotions, it's important to learn to express feelings, whether they be positive or negative, because all feelings are valid. Talking to friends and family, talking to a counselor, joining a support group for people in similar situations, participating in artistic activities like painting or drawing, and writing down your thoughts are all healthy ways to express your emotions that will positively contribute to your mental well-being. On top of all of those things, there are activities that you can do every day to help maintain a positive mental outlook uh, during your situation. Staying connected with those that you love is more important than ever right now. You can do this through family game nights or dinner nights that are either socially distanced or through video calls. Writing letters to loved ones or, journal or journaling are helpful ways to organize your thoughts into words. Spending at least 15 to 20 minutes outside every day, either gardening, walking, or just sitting and enjoying fresh air can go a long way towards feeling better. There are many outdoor socially distanced activities at Center Grove Orchard, Berry Patch Farm, Geisler Farms, Iowa Orchard, and Howell's Pumpkin Patch that can safely allow you to have fun outdoor experiences. Making sure you're getting seven to nine hours of restful sleep a night will also have a very positive impact on mental health. If you are able, adopting a pet to act as a companion is shown to improve moods and motivation in day-to-day -day life. Also, don't forget to exercise your mind. Doing crosswords, Sudoku, or jigsaw puzzles can be a great way to keep your mind active, and an active mind can improve mood. This is by no means an exhaustive list, but it is a list to get you started if you're looking for ways to improve your mental health in your day-to-day -day life. All that being said, why did we choose to talk about this topic today? We chose this topic because of the situation that the world is in with this global pandemic forcing physical and social isolation on us all. Mental health issues have been arising in every population as a direct result of the state of our world. There is a societal stigma around talking about mental health and admitting that you are struggling with these feelings, so no one talks about it. We think that needs to change. We want you to know that it's okay if you are experiencing these things, or if you know someone who is struggling with these feelings, to give you tools to help them through it. There are steps that you can actively take to improving your mental health. It's really easy right now to get caught up in all of the negativity in the world, but if you can find one positive thing in every day, because there is always at least one positive in every day, you will find that you have a new appreciation for life. That's not always easy to do, and sometimes you need people to help you do that, but know that you are not alone and there are resources to help you along your way. These three organizations are excellent resources for anyone who is struggling with their mental health. The National Alliance for Mental Illness is available for social engagements that talk about the importance of being open and destigmatizing mental health discussions. The National Suicide Prevention Lifeline and the Disaster Distress Helpline are available 24 seven to talk if you feel like you need someone to help you through what you are feeling. The most important thing to remember is that you are not alone. Thank you for attending this topic in your virtual senior health fair, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.
Hello, my name is Cameron Taylor. I am the president of the Student American Academy of Osteopathy. Thank you for joining us today for our osteopathic self-treatment to promote health and the body's ability to fight COVID-19. So first we wanted to talk a little bit about what is a doctor of osteopathy. We are fully licensed physicians, just like MDs. We do four years of medical school and we do a residency. We utilize all scientifically accepted methods of diagnosis and treatments which includes drugs and medications, but there's a lot more to being a DO. In addition, we receive an additional training in what the osteopathic profession believes to be the most significant factor in comprehensive healthcare. We recognize that the musculoskeletal system, bones, muscles, and joints, is interdependent. A disturbance in one can affect the other functions in the body. So DOs use structural diagnosis, manipulative therapy, of the musculoskeletal system along with traditional forms of medicine. We do this by diagnosing people with our hands. So a DO is not just something else, but we're something more. Just for the preface, I wanted to let you know that you could pause the video and follow the link to the handout. The handout follows the demonstration. So osteopathic manipulative Treatment, also known as OMT, has been shown in numerous studies to support the body's own healing mechanisms, including beneficial effects on respiratory infections. Based on well-established osteopathic principles, this OST aims to promote the optimal breathing and circulation to support the function of the immune and nervous systems, while helping to reduce stress and maintain balance in the body. This OST provides exercises designed to remove obstacles to the body's own functions and therefore promote health. It is useful to use for those at risk of infection or those who are already tested positive for COVID-19. There is utility in these approaches for patients that must self-isolate and socially distance, such as during the 2020 COVID-19 pandemic. These treatments are going to be done by you. However, OMT is done by a physician. The following video was performed by Dr. Figueroa and Dr. Lewis and Ryan McDunn, a fourth year fellow. Without further ado, here is our video. Welcome. I'm Dr. Drew Lewis, an associate professor in the OMM department at Des Moines University. We are pleased to share with you today a set of exercises to help promote health and help the body fight off infections like COVID-19. Several of the goals of our osteopathic self-treatment are to improve the respiratory circulatory system, to enhance the immune system, to balance the nervous system, and to reduce stress. All of the exercises and stretches you'll see here should be performed in a pain-free manner. If there's any pain or discomfort, you should stop. This osteopathic self-treatment is meant to be performed in addition to and not in replacement of all other medical advice of your providers. First exercise, addressing the first rib or uppermost rib and collarbone at the base of the neck, also called the thoracic inlet. How to perform this exercise? Rib one and the collarbone are at the base of the neck on the left and right sides. To make sure these bones move properly, we will use arm and shoulder movements person can be either be standing or sitting down. Perform arms, arm circles slowly while inhaling as you raise the arm and exhaling as the arms are lowered down. Perform arm circles in both directions, one arm at a time. For example, arms forward and up or arms backward and up to start the circle. You may repeat three to five times in one direction and reverse. <clears throat> then do the same thing but just with a shoulder blade. Large circles with the shoulder blades in both directions. Next exercise. First thoracic vertebra at the base of the neck. Thoracic inlet. This is to be performed seated. Uh, the top vertebra of the thoracic spine, or T1, is at the bottom of the neck. We will use the neck and head movements to make sure this bone moves properly. Do not perform this exercise 
if moving the neck in certain directions makes you dizzy. With a straight back and shoulders, look to the left as far as possible without tilting the head and without causing pain or dizziness. Repeat the same to the right. Look back to the front. Then look down, bending the head forward as far as it goes without causing pain or dizziness. Look to the front. Then look up, bending the head backwards as far as it goes without pain or dizziness. Look back to the front. Without looking to the left or right, or down or up, tilt the head to the left as far as it goes, and then to the right. Look back to the front. And then combine these motions by moving the neck in a circular fashion, first to one side and then to the other side, making sure there's no pain or dizziness. After you do the circles, sit in the chair to make sure you're not dizzy before standing. Next exercise addresses the muscles between the bottom of the ribs and the pelvis or hips. How to perform? Sit on a chair with feet flat on the ground and the weight of the body distributed evenly on both sitting bones. Without lifting the hips, lean to the right as far as you can. Then lift the left arm to one side and up until you feel a stretch on the lower body from the lower rib cage to the hip. And then start to slump your low back to increase the stretch. Hold for 10 to 20 seconds and then repeat to the other side. Next exercise is a self-correction of the head on the neck area or occipital to atlas joint. Per the person is seated. Place both hands on the back of the neck just under the skull. Fingers may or may not overlap. Move the head on, on the hands back and forth side to side turning to one side and then the other tilting to one side and then the other. The aim is to free up the head connection to the top of the neck. Move slowly to stretch the tightest areas of the neck. Repeat each direction of motion, turning, tilting the head to one side and the other, bending the head forward and backwards, three to five times in each direction until even motion is felt. Next exercise, self-correction of the atlas and axis joint, which is at the top of the neck. This area is involved in turning of the head. How to perform? Start by sitting in the chair with your head bent forward as far as it goes without pain. Test the turning or rotation of the neck to the left and then to the right without lifting the head to find out which side turns less than the other. To make the movement symmetric, keep the neck bent forward and turn the head towards the tightest side, the side that does not go as far as the other side. Keep the head turned that way for three seconds. Turn the head a little farther in the same direction and wait another three seconds. Turn the head a little farther in the same direction and wait another three seconds. With the head bent forward, move the head in both directions again to see if the head moves equally on both sides. Front of neck muscle stretch. How to perform? Sit on a chair with your back and neck straight. Grasp the chair with your left hand and gently pull down on your left collarbone with your right hand. Lean your whole body to the right and bend the neck to the right, bringing the ear towards the right shoulder. Keeping that position, turn the head or rotate to the left. Position the head back with the chin up and slowly tuck your chin until a stretch is felt in the front of the neck on the left side. Hold for 10 to 20 seconds and then repeat the above steps on the other side. Upper back stretch, muscle's name is levator scapula. How to perform? With the left hand sec sec securely grasping a chair, slowly lean the body toward the right and a little forward until a stretch is felt. 
position the head in a forward position with the chin down, leaning to the right and turning the head to the right. To intensify the stretch if needed, gently place the right hand on top of the head and add gentle pressure to the right. Hold for 10 to 20 seconds. Repeat the above steps by reversing the direction of motion to stretch to the left side. Next exercise is the upper shoulder stretch. Muscle name is upper trapezius. How to perform? Sit with your back and neck straight. Grasp the chair with your left hand. Lean to the right. Position the head forward. Bend the neck and tuck your chin. Turn the head to the left. With the right hand, slowly and gently encourage further stretch to the right for a gentle stretch. Emphasis on the stretch can be added by nodding or tucking the chin towards the chest. Hold for 10 to 20 seconds. Repeat the above steps by reversing the direction of the motions to stretch the left side of the upper back. Next exercise, head and neck posture training by strengthening the deep muscles in front of the neck. How to perform? Person is sitting. Place your hand on the superficial front neck muscles. These muscles should not tighten during the exercise. While seated, nod the head forward slowly. Tuck the chin toward the chest rather than bending the head forward. Hold for 5 to 10 seconds. Relax. Repeat the above steps two more times. Then, throughout the day, concentrate on keeping good head neck posture. Next exercise. Gentle self-massage of the neck and upper shoulder. How to perform. Person is seated with the left arm relaxed. Take the right hand, cross it over the front of the body and reach the upper shoulder muscles. Pull the upper shoulder muscles forward rhythmically from the shoulder to the left side of the neck and back to the shoulder gently but firmly. You can also pinch that muscle for a few seconds between the thumb and the fingers to relax it more. With the right arm still in front of the body, place the fingers of the neck on the left side of the back of the neck and pull forward rhythmically in sections from the base of the neck to the top and then reverse. The head and neck may stay still or move as it is comfortable. The next step is to change the hand positions by moving the right hand to behind the neck on the left side. Place the fingers on the left side of the neck and pull up and back by sections rhythmically from the bottom of the neck to the top and back down. Repeat all these to the other side. Next exercise, underarm and back muscle stretch. Muscle's name is latissimus dorsi. This stretch is also called the prayer position stretch. How to perform? Kneel in front of a chair. Place the elbows on top of the chair with the hands and forearms together. Make sure the elbows stay together the whole time since this will serve to separate the shoulder blades. Slowly press the chest forward to the floor as you sit back on your heels. Once the shoulders are on stretch, tighten your abdominal muscles and hunch your whole back up to increase your stretch. Hold for 10 to 20 seconds. Note, if you do not feel the stretch in the lower back, it is because the knees may be too far away from the chair. If that's the case, reposition yourself by bringing the knees a little closer to the chair and start all over again. Front of hip muscle stretch. Muscle name, psoas. How to perform? To stretch the right front of the hip muscle, kneel with the right knee on the floor and the left hip bent to 90 degrees and the left knee bent to 90 degrees. Then slide the left foot forward about six inches. Rest the left hand of the left on the left thigh or hold on to a chair with the left hand for balance. Position the right leg so that the right foot is turned out 
and the upper thigh is rotated or facing inward. Pull the stomach and tighten the right buttocks hard. Keep the right hand on the buttocks to feel the contraction. Already you should start to feel a stretch in the front of the right hip and thigh area. For a bigger stretch, add the following. Keep the shoulders positioned over the hips and use the left leg to pull the body and the right hip forward, feeling a stretch in the front of the right hip and thigh. Face down, pressing up. How to perform? Lie down on the floor with your chest and stomach facing down. Using your arms, push the upper body off the floor, keeping the front of the hips on the floor to create a stretch from the chin to the belly. To intensify the stretch, you may tilt your head backwards to look up as long as this does not cause pain in the back or neck or dizziness. Hold for 10 to 20 seconds. Next exercise, spinal stimulation, thoracic and rib areas. How to perform? Lie on your back with your feet on the ground and knees up, arms folded in front of your chest and head off the floor. Lift the buttocks, rounding your back, starting at the hips and moving up the spine until reaching the base of the neck. The back has the shape of the foot of a rocking chair at this time. Keeping the head off the floor and the back bent forward, lower the hips, feeling each segment of the spine contact the floor. Do this movement back and forth in a rocking motion. Emphasis can be placed on the middle of the spine, then on the right side, then on the left side, or vice versa. This needs to be a smooth motion. Repeat five to 10 times. Next exercise. This exercise addresses the bottom of the spine. How to perform? Lie on your back. Bring both knees up, keeping the feet on the floor. Twist the bottom of the spine by bringing the knees to the right as far as they go, while keeping the shoulders flat against the floor. Hold for 10 to 20 seconds. Repeat the same motion by bringing the knees to the other side. Next exercise. A special thank you to Dr. Figueroa, Dr. Lewis, and Ryan McDunn, a fourth year fellow. If you have any questions, please send them to the school. And here are the links again with the video and the handout. Thank you. Hey everyone, thanks for joining us. My name is Kaya Veldman. I'm a second year DO student here at DMU. I'm also president of the Preventative Medicine Club. We're gonna give you a talk today on nutrition and staying healthy, um, as well as preventing disease before it happens. I hope you enjoy it. There are a few changes that happen to our body as we age. Um, as we age, our body's nutritional needs change and eating nutritional food is important to maintain our weight and to stay energized. We also become more susceptible to certain chronic health conditions, such as type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and osteoporosis. Lifestyle modifications, including a well-balanced diet and exercise, can help manage and lower the risk of developing chronic conditions. It has been estimated that up to a third of cancers are related to overweight or obesity, physical inactivity, and poor nutrition. Here we have a nice visual on some of the lifestyle modifications that are recommended to stay healthy and to prevent chronic disease as well as cancer. Um, we're going to talk about a few of these today, including being physically active, eating a diet rich in whole grains, vegetables, fruit, and beans, limiting consumption of fast foods and other processed foods, um, limiting consumption of red meat and processed meat. We're also going to talk about supplements and um, how those are not always recommended and from here we're going to go and talk about diet.
Like we talked about on the last slide, we would like to focus on nutrient-rich foods to obtain vitamins, minerals, protein, carbohydrates, and fats that our bodies need. Um, here we have a guideline on a healthy plate. So we'd like to fill half the plate with a non-starchy vegetable. So that could be spinach, broccoli, mushrooms, green beans, onions, anything in that um, vegetable category. And a tip is if you buy frozen vegetables, those are a great low cost and sustainable option. They have all the nutrients you need and you don't have to worry about them going bad. Um, and then fill a fourth of your plate with a healthy grain or starchy vegetable. So that could be brown rice as we see in the picture here. It could be sweet potatoes, oats, whole grain bread or pastas. And the last fourth of our plate we wanna fill with a lean protein. So a rotisserie, rotisserie chicken is a great convenient option um, that could be turkey, it could also be black beans or any type of bean. And another tip is to try to limit your deli meats, those are high in sodium. And then we'd like to cut down on red meat intake as well. And then as an option you can always add fruit, a salad, or an ounce of nuts for some extra protein and fat. And like we said, we kind of want to avoid the processed foods and the fast foods um, and focus more on a whole food based diet. A common question amongst the general population is, do I need supplements? Eating a well-balanced diet is enough to provide you with the nutrients you need. If you are not getting enough vitamins and minerals, your doctor may recommend you a supplement. If you are over 50, oftentimes calcium, vitamin D, vitamin B6, and vitamin B12 are recommended. As we age, we get bone loss, which can lead to fractures in older men and women. Taking calcium or vitamin D supplements, if you are not getting enough in your diet, can help keep your bones strong. On this slide are just some examples of foods that have good sources of calcium, vitamin D, vitamin B6, and vitamin B12 in them. Um, it would be good to try to incorporate these foods into your diet. So foods high in calcium are milk and milk products or dark green leafy vegetables such as kale. Uh, foods that have a lot of vitamin D include fatty fish and vitamin D fortified milk. Vitamin B6 has, is found in potatoes, bananas, and chicken breasts, and then vitamin B12 in fortified cereal. While taking dietary supplements, it is always very important to tell your doctor exactly what you are taking. The FDA does not regulate supplements as they are not considered medications. Adverse risks can occur with medications that you may already be taking. A common medication that many people take is warfarin. It is important not to eat grapefruit or drink grapefruit juice on, while on warfarin as it decreases your body's ability to metabolize the drug. Exercise is one of the most important things you can do to stay healthy and decrease your risk of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and hypertension. Exercise is not only helpful to prevent disease, but also helpful to prevent the worsening of diseases. The hardest part about exercising for all ages is starting to do so. But remember that any exercise is better than being inactive. It is important to do something that you enjoy and that is not difficult on your body. Things such as brisk walking, swimming, and biking can be a fun and a good way to get aerobic exercise. The CDC recommends 150 minutes per week of, ex of aerobic exercise. These are things such as running, walking, biking, swimming. For adults 65 years of age or older. Know your limitations though. If you are beginning to find it difficult to keep up with your activities, scale back what you are doing or choose an exercise that is not, is, is not as vigorous. Swimming can be very easy on the joints and is a popular aerobic exercise. The most important part about choosing an exercise to do weekly is choosing something that you enjoy. It can be hard to begin to work out, but this may be easier if you start a walking group with friends or family. You can also walk to your favorite coffee shop or your favorite restaurant instead of driving there. The pace should be leisurely. You should be able to talk while you're doing your walking. All of these things, although they may seem small at first, will make a huge difference in your everyday health, especially if you keep up the habits. You may also want to incorporate strength training. This includes lifting weights, home body workouts, and resistant band strength workouts, which we'll talk about in the next slide. It is important to have a discussion though with your primary care doctor if you are making any major lifestyle changes, just so that they're on the same page and can offer any recommendations or also any concerns. I think that using resistance bands are a great way to incorporate strength training into your weekly exercise. Resistance bands are cheap 
and can be done anywhere. So they are perfect for today in COVID-19 with social distancing. Here is a resistance band that you can carry with you and you can use in different areas in your house or uh, at work just for a quick workout and to incorporate strength training into your uh, workout regime. Make sure while performing these exercises though that you have a safe place to complete them and you can keep your balance. I included three different examples in the bottom of the slide that can be a good place to start. There are also many resources that offer different resistant band training programs and different workout groups that meet. So guys, I thought it would be uh, really helpful if I was able to show you how to do some of these resistance bands that we'll describe in the previous slide. So remember, before doing any type of exercise that's uh, outside of your normal lifestyle, con consult your primary care physician and also make sure you have a good area to work with and be able to keep your balance at all times. Those are definitely the most important things to consider when starting a new exercise, and in this case, resistance band training. So the first uh, exercise is gonna be the chest press, and you wanna have your arms in a comfortable, grab the resistance band comfortably, and your arms in a comfortable position right outside your chest, and then just bring your arms out as so. Really able to feel that stretch in your arms. I can do this as many times as you want. So the next uh, stretch is called the uh, leg press. For this one, you can be sitting. You should be sitting down and be in a sturdy chair, and also be able to uh, have good back support and also have your balance. You want to put your leg into the resistance band and have a good support on it, and grab your arms, your arms at a 90 degree angle in front of the on um, front of the chair, and then push your leg out. Remembering to keep your balance at all times. The last stretch is the lateral leg, lateral arm raise. And for this, you would stand on the resistance band as if it was a jump rope with, and you have your rope underneath it, making sure to have your resistance band at the middle of your feet so it doesn't fall from, get pulled from underneath. And maintain your balance and pull your arms up as much as you can. And those are the stretches described in the uh, previous slide, and I hope this was able to help you if you wanted to try these at home. If you would like to receive a free resistance band and sample exercises so you can try these out for yourself, please send your name and mailing address to jacob.d.hamilton at dmu.edu, and we'll send one over to you. Thanks again for watching our presentation, and we hope that you learned something. Hi there, my name is Alyssa Krieger and I'm a first year DO student at DMU. Um, I am a part of Anatomy Ambassadors and I'm interested in maybe going to family medicine or pediatrics. Hi there, my name is Molly O'Brien and I'm also a first year DO student at Des Moines University um, in the Anatomy Ambassadors Club. Um, okay, so jumping right in, today we're going to talk about um, the aging of the brain and what that kind of looks like. Um, so on this slide here, we have the pictures of the four lobes in the brain. In shaded in red is going to be your frontal lobe. So that's going to be right behind your um, forehead. And this is going to be responsible for decision making, voluntary movement, also impulse control, emotional control, any planning and problem solving um, that you're doing in your day to day life. Uh, the next one right behind that shaded in yellow is called your parietal lobe. And this is going to be mainly responsible for temperature, taste, and touch, as well as some space, spatial awareness. Um, right behind your ear, you have your temporal lobe. And on the slide, it's shaded in green. Um, the temporal lobe is responsible for hearing and memory integration. So it takes the different sensory information that we're receiving and helps that, or sorry, integrates that and uses it to help create memories. Um, the occipital lobe in purple is gonna be right at the back of your head, and that's gonna be mostly responsible for vision. Okay, so next we're gonna dive a little bit into some of the common disorders that we see um, as you age within the brain. As I'm sure you all are aware of, um, dementia is a very prevalent disorder. Um, we kind of like to think of it as an umbrella term 
um, to describe a group of disorders that can affect things like memory, reasoning, behavior, and other higher level cognitive functions like those. Um, dementia can have a wide variety of causes, um, including prolonged alcohol use, and is typically linked to some kind of pathological or like physical finding within the brain itself. Um, so think about the neurons, those cells that compose your brain, think about those dying or losing their connections, and then they're unable to communicate effectively with their neighbors in order to do what they have to do. Um, the two biggest categories in the U.S. for dementia are Alzheimer's disease, which accounts for about 40 to 70 percent of all dementia cases, as well as vascular dementia, which accounts for about 15 to 30 percent of all dementia cases. Um, so to talk about Alzheimer's a little bit more in depth, um, Alzheimer's is characterized by a buildup of a certain protein that we call beta amyloid. Um, this accumulates outside of the cells and forms plaques. Um, which are never really good if you're trying to get your neurons to communicate nice and well with each other. Um, it's also characterized by a buildup of a uh, protein that we call tau protein, um, and that occurs within the neurons, the cells themselves, um, and can form neurofibrillary tangles, which is one of the hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease within the brain. Um, the buildup of these proteins can actually be kind of toxic, um, and that's when you start to see those really classic symptoms of memory loss, language loss, uh, inability to plan, and other higher order functions like that. On the flip side, we have vascular dementia, which basically just refers to any sort of dementia disorder um, that is caused more by a blood vessel restriction. So if you think about not getting um, enough oxygen to the brain, your cells aren't going to do so well. They're not going to perform well. Um, and this vascular dementia can come from a really wide variety of causes, uh, commonly things like stroke. Okay, so that is going to lead us into our next slide. Um, strokes are a very common thing to happen as we age. Um, under normal conditions, the brain uses a large amount of oxygen and glucose that we take from our diet to function properly. Uh, so the cells are constantly firing to create our thoughts and even controlling things that we don't have to actually actively think about, like breathing. So when someone has a stroke, the blood is not able to reach the brain tissue and therefore cannot function properly. There are two main types of strokes listed here. The first is ischemic stroke, and this is going to happen when you have a clot in your arteries in the brain, thus preventing the blood flow. So this kind of happens when we eat a really fatty meal um, that it causes an increase in flat fat, excuse me, in our arteries, and that can calcify over time and build up in the walls of our arteries. Um, this can happen all over the body, and then normal blood flow, um, high blood pressure, that can cause some of the plaques to break off and travel throughout the, blood, the bloodstream. Um, some of those plaques can end up in the tiny vessels in our brain and that causes the ischemic stroke. Um, so when you don't have that blood to that tissue, the oxygen and the energy resources that your brain depends on are no longer available and then it can't carry out those basic functions that we need. So um, the next one is gonna be hemorrhagic stroke and this is caused by high blood pressure or aneurysms that leads to leaky or ruptured arteries in the brain um, so that the brain the blood is going to damage those the brain tissue and then also it can't do its job it can't feed that tissue um, for normal function so one thing we really want to talk about here is acting fast it's an acronym for kind of looking for signs and symptoms of a stroke if you think someone is having one um, the first is f is for face um, so first you're going to ask the person to smile and look for facial dropping. Um, this usually happens if you're having a stroke on one side of your brain. It's going to cause limited movement on the other side, if that makes any sense. Um, so the person is going to be smiling on one side and the other side is going to look um, kind of droopy. So the next one is going to be arms. Ask the person to raise the, um, their arms above their head, and if one is lower than the other, that's also a very indicative sign of a stroke. Um, you can also ask the person to repeat something back to you. So say just a simple saying, and if you hear any slurred speech, that can be a sign of a stroke. The next thing that the most important is time. Um, if you notice any of these um, signs that I've listed above, call for help immediately and then make sure that you are writing down the time that you first saw the symptoms. Um, this is really important for doctors and medical staff to 
um, to know so that they can get the treatment within a reasonable amount of time and hopefully restore blood flow that, to that tissue before any um, cell death happens. And I'll just interject quickly. I did work in an ER previously or prior to coming to medical school. And I know a lot of patients would come in thinking, oh, I'm not really sure. Maybe this isn't what's happening. The doctors will always, always, always see you. You'd much rather be safe than sorry. So if you're even seeing a couple of these, it's better to just go get it checked out. Um, so the next topic we are going to discuss is cerebral atrophy. Um, it kind of sounds like a big scary word, but what that really means is that your brain is shrinking. So to a point, this is actually a normal process as you age. Um, it shouldn't look quite as dramatic as maybe the picture that I've posted here, um, but it is normal to a point. It's kind of a slow process when it's naturally occurring. Um, it can also occur at a more rapid speed um, with certain disorders like the ones that we've talked about. For example, you can see the picture on this slide. Picture A is of a nice, normal, healthy brain. So you can see the tissue looks very like, um, very full. Uh, the grooves in all the areas of the brain look a little bit smaller. You can see that the tissue has like a nice firm look to it. It just looks like really healthy brain tissue. On the flip side, if you look at picture B, this uh, is a brain from an Alzheimer's patient. Um, and as you can see, the grooves look a little bit deeper in this one. Um, the tissue maybe looks a little less full. Uh, there's a lot more space happening. And just the overall size of it is um, pretty well impacted by this atrophy here. Um, so when it comes to cerebral atrophy, some areas of the brain can be affected more than others. Um, one of the huge ones uh, that is seen across the board as one of the most common places to have this atrophy or this shrinking is your prefrontal cortex. So if you'll remember back to the first slide that we talked about with the four lobes of the brain, your prefrontal cortex is found within the frontal lobe, which was that red one up by your forehead. Um, so this prefrontal cortex, like the frontal lobe, is involved in things like decision making, planning, your higher order functioning, right? Um, another place that's common to see atrophy or shrinking is the temporal lobe, which is the one that you'll remember is the green one that we showed on the first slide, um, kind of behind your ear. And that one, as we talked about before, is involved in memory creation, which kind of makes sense if you think about some of the symptoms of these disorders, right? Um, the least impacted usually is the occipital lobe, which was that back purple one, kind of in the back of your head. Um, and that one was responsible for vision changes. So it makes sense that with these uh, disorders that we've been talking about, that would be the one that would be the least impacted by the shrinking because vision changes and significant vision loss aren't necessarily a hallmark of things like Alzheimer's or stroke. Um, on a more uh, cellular basis, what's really happening here, as your brain is shrinking, you're kind of seeing your neurons, those basic cells of our brain, um, kind of die off and start to lose their connections with the uh, neurons around them. So neurons communicate via chemical and electrical signaling. So as those synapses, those connections between your neurons die off, your brain isn't able to communicate effectively. I like to think of this as if you were to um, go visit your neighbor, you would take the sidewalk, walk over to their house, say hi, you know, have a conversation. That's how you would normally do it because you have the sidewalk there, you have the normal pathway there. However, if the construction crew were to come through and take down your sidewalk, you couldn't just walk over there anymore. You would have to kind of yell between driveways. Is that a super effective form of communication? Probably not. Is there gonna be a couple of mishaps occur because maybe one person can't hear the other? Probably. So you can kind of think about that little metaphor when you're thinking about what's going on on a cellular basis as your brain shrinks. Um, so as we've talked about, this is important for cell com or, uh, for neuron communication, but the shrinking of your brain is also very important when you're considering the extra space. So as your brain tissue is shrinking, that doesn't mean that your skull is shrinking, right? That doesn't mean that your whole head gets smaller. So you think about um, the nice, healthy, full brain in picture A taking up the full skull. Um, there's not a lot of wiggle room. You know, it's kind of the skull is doing its function of really protecting it, kind of like a nice helmet on there versus brain B in the skull, if it's a lot smaller, there's gonna be a lot more space and it might rattle around a little bit. Um, and this could lead to things like traumatic brain injuries or maybe even bleeds. 
This is especially important to consider if you're at increased fall risk um, for whatever reason, or if you're on blood thinners, because we really don't want to see any sort of injury happen within the brain, because that's only going to lead to more consequences. All right, so next we're going to talk about some risk factors for the previous things we've talked about. Um, high, blush, high blood pressure and high cholesterol are two big ones. Um, I mentioned before the high cholesterol can cause the plaque, which you see on the, um, the right side, the right vessel in the picture. That's going to be plaque buildup. So again, that can break off, cause the stroke, um, and high blood pressure can contribute to that problem as well as um, the hemorrhagic strokes in your brain. Uh, diabetes, smoking, heavy alcohol use, this also increases the, the lipid content, the cholesterol content in your blood um, and can further cause problems. And then poor sleep is huge. Um, we need that sleep for our brain to rest, um, heal itself in a natural way. Luckily, there are a couple of things that we can do in order to keep our brains nice and healthy um, as we're young and as we age. Um, so I like this. I took this from a website, one of the sites that we sorted, or the, one of the sites that we cited down below in the next slide. Um, chronological age doesn't correspond to biological age. So the number might be different than what your actual brain and body looks like. I think we're all crossing our fingers that our biological age is younger than our chronological age so we can continue to do the things that we love. One important preventative measure, and I'm sure you've all heard this at your annual checkups with your regular physicians, diet and exercise, diet and exercise, diet and exercise. It is so important to keep your body healthy by putting good things into it and using it to do things. Um, you want to make sure you're getting a nice, well-rounded, well-balanced diet, as well as decreasing maybe some of the fattier foods in your junk food. Um, and as far as exercise goes, you don't have to be a marathon runner in order to keep your brain healthy. Even just things like a simple walk with friends or spending some time out in the garden or picking up a new hobby, maybe a new sport or golf or anything like that. Anything that keeps you moving is going to be fantastic for your body and for your brain. If you're a smoker, you would also probably want to consider decreasing your smoking as that, as Molly talked about on the previous slide, can contribute to that plaque buildup within your vessels. And we want to make sure that your blood is flowing as well as possible. Um, alcohol use, especially in excess, can also be contributing to some of these issues. So make sure you watch your alcohol intake. Moderation is absolutely key, as I'm sure you're all aware by now. Um, and the final thing that we have listed here is just to stay mentally active. So whether that means socializing with friends or picking up knitting or trying out a new hobby, maybe even just doing, you know, crossword puzzles or trivia games, anything like that is going to be um, beneficial for your brain in the long run. Okay, so that brings us to the end of our presentation. Um, we want to thank you all for tuning in and listening to us talk about brain aging and what happens over time. Um, we wish you all the best and we hope you stay happy and healthy. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. At Des Moines University's Family Medicine Clinic, our goal is to provide you with compassionate care that is comprehensive. From caring from children to the elderly, our medical team provides holistic preventative guidance on how you and your family can maintain a healthy lifestyle and manage any symptoms that may arise so that you can be at your best. During the current COVID-19 pandemic, maintaining your health as well as a safe lifestyle has never been more important. Our providers are here to help when acute conditions affect you or your family. We treat musculoskeletal injuries, infections, illnesses, and many other medical conditions. As an academic medical center, DMU is training tomorrow's healthcare providers on how to provide expert care to people from all backgrounds. We invite you to visit the Family Medicine Clinic at Des Moines University. We offer the care and attention you deserve.
At Des Moines University Clinic, you'll find healthcare professionals with only one priority, you, the patient. Come see us for the very best in family medicine, physical therapy, podiatric medicine, and osteopathic manual medicine. Call today to schedule an appointment.
Hello everyone, thank you for attending the 50 and Better Fair. My name is Ryan Starkman. I am a second year student here at Des Moines University and I'm the current president of the Emergency Medicine Interest Group. And I'm here to talk to you guys a little bit about when you should go to the emergency department today. First, I'd like to start off by talking a little bit about the local emergency departments here in the Des Moines area. In the top right corner, you'll see Iowa Methodist Medical Center, which is a part of the Unity Point Health Des Moines. This is a level one trauma center as well as a level two stroke center, meaning that they are capable of handling any type of trauma as well as treating strokes. Unity Point also has Lutheran Hospital as well as Methodist West Hospital in their family. In the bottom left hand corner is Mercy One Medical Center downtown. This is a level one stroke center as well as a level two trauma center meaning that they are capable of treating strokes and are able to do a couple of advanced procedures as well, as well as treating any type of trauma that comes in. Mercy One also has Mercy West in its family as well. In the top left hand corner is Broadlawns. They also have an emergency department in town here that is capable of treat treating most medical emergencies. And finally, in the bottom right-hand corner is the VA hospital here in Des Moines. This hospital is specific for treating patients that are veterans, but are capable of transferring out to higher level care centers if needed. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about what the emergency department is. The first thing I'd like to mention is that the ER is a safe place to be, whether you feel in danger physically, mentally, or any type of abuse is going on, we will not turn you away for anything. Each emergency department will have an ER physician on duty, as well as some nurse practitioners or physician assistants that are trained in emergency medicine. Every emergency room nurse is trained in advanced cardiac life support, and some are trained in advanced trauma life support as well. We understand that the word emergency means different things to different people and want to ensure that we take your emergency as our emergency as well. And every complaint that is brought into the ER is taken very seriously. For those of you that have been to the emergency department before, whether that was for yourself or with family, you have probably had to set it up in the waiting room. This can be a very frustrating thing as the wait times can be pretty long. This is not only frustrating for you, but it is also frustrating for staff, as we would like to get you seen as soon as possible. Unfortunately, the hospital is a very busy place and it is often completely filled, causing a backup into the emergency department. Those patients needing to be admitted often sit in emergency rooms for quite a while before they get a bed up in the hospital. This causes a significant backup as the emergency department can go from 30 beds down to 10 very quickly. This makes it sometimes very difficult to move patients efficiently. When you arrive at the hospital, an ER nurse will take you into the triage room and ask you about what symptoms you're having today and take your vital signs. Those patients with abnormal vital signs or certain symptoms will get to go back to the emergency department first. Some ERs have a fast track area where less sick patients can be seen very quickly and discharged home. This means that some of the less sick patients will get seen before some of the patients that fall in the middle ground where that need to go back to the main emergency department. Again, we understand that this can be a very frustrating thing, but we want to ensure that your emergency is our emergency and we take all complaints very, very seriously. In the next few slides, I'm going to talk about some of the medical emergencies that need to be seen in the ER as soon as possible. All of these are time sensitive and the quicker you get to the ER, the better the outcome. The first thing I'd like to talk about is a stroke. There are two types of strokes that can occur. The first one is an ischemic stroke where there is either a blockage of arteries or a blood clot that travels up to the brain. This causes a lack of oxygen and causes part of the brain to start to die off. This is the type of stroke that if caught early enough can be treated with a medication called TPA in the emergency department. This medication breaks down blood clots and has been shown only to be beneficial if given within the first four and a half hours 
of the onset of the stroke. The second type of stroke that can occur is a hemorrhagic stroke. This most often is caused by falls or trauma to the head, but can also be caused by brain aneurysms. The bleeding causes a lack of oxygen to the brain as well as can put pressure on other parts of the brain causing symptoms. The picture on your screen has the acronym BFAST on it. The B stands for balance, whether that's a loss of balance, a headache, or dizziness. E stands for eyes, and this can be blurred vision or loss of vision. The F stands for face, and that's one side of the face that ends up drooping, and this can be a telltale sign of a stroke. A stands for arms or legs, uh, and that's where one arm or leg is weak or you can't move it. S stands for speech difficulty, whether that's trouble getting words out or gargled speech or you can't get the correct word. And the T emphasizes time. If you experience any of these symptoms, it is important to get to the emergency department as quickly as possible, whether that's calling an ambulance or coming in through the front door. But one important thing to note is please do not drive yourself to the emergency department. The next thing we are going to talk about is chest pain. Chest pain is always an emergency, especially if you are over the age of 50. Although there are many different things that can cause chest pain, the biggest thing we worry about is a heart attack. A heart attack is caused by a blockage of the arteries in your heart, causing a lack of oxygen to the heart muscle. The heart muscle can survive for 30 minutes without oxygen, but it means that it is very important that you get to the ER as quickly as possible with any type of chest pain. Any type of pain in the jaw or the shoulders is considered chest pain in the ER, and you will have a cardiac workup done. Upon arriving to the ER, it is standard to get an EKG, which is a picture of your heart that will be seen by the doctor within the first couple of minutes. This is a great test to see if you are actively having a heart attack. If this is the case, you will be sent to the cath lab where the interventional cardiologist will attempt to place a stint to open up back up the artery and return blood flow to the heart muscle. If this is done quickly enough, there will be less damage done to the heart and there will be a better prognosis. The important symptoms to look out for include chest pain, especially that is crushing or squeezing and can radiate into your jaw or arm or through to your back. Some of the associated symptoms include shortness of breath, nausea and vomiting, cold sweats, or a fast or irregular pulse. If you are experiencing any of these symptoms, don't hesitate to seek out medical assistance. A reminder to not drive yourself to the emergency department if you are having any of those symptoms. We are now going to talk, be talking about falls. One of the biggest issues about falls, especially for those that are living independently, is the ability to reach help after this has occurred. Devices such as Life Alert and even some of the high, new high-tech watches are extremely useful in notifying authorities or family members when you have fallen or are in trouble. These have saved many people's lives and I highly suggest having a plan in case you fall. Nobody plans on falling, but being prepared in case it happens can make a huge difference in the outcome. There are two significant injuries that we worry about with falls. The first and most time sensitive is a head injury. Falling and hitting your head can cause bleeding in the brain. This is especially the case if you are on medication such as Warfarin or Coumadin, Plavix, Eliquis, Xarelto, Relenta, or Pradaxa, or any other medications that that is labeled as a blood thinner. The second major injury is a lower extremity injury such as a hip or pelvis fracture or femur fracture. These types of injuries make it difficult to move from the place that you fell and can cause issues with reaching out for help. As stated before, having a plan in case you fall can make a drastic difference in the outcome. I now wanna say a few words about the current situation with the COVID-19 pandemic. We are learning new things every day about this virus, and there is unfortunately a lot of misinformation floating around. This is a serious disease, especially in your age group. The signs and symptoms are very broad and include fever, fatigue, dry cough, aches and pains, 
runny nose, loss of smell, sore throat, shortness of breath, and diarrhea, just to name a few. It is also true that many people don't have any symptoms and can spread the disease without knowing they even have it. This makes it extremely difficult to pick out who is possibly infected and who isn't just by looking at symptoms and vital signs. This being said, every person that walks into the emergency department is treated as if they are positive for COVID-19 and precautions such as gowning, gloving, face masks are being used in order to prevent or eliminate the threat of spreading the disease to other patients or employees. The staff has been heavily, heavily trained in infection prevention and in, in order to minimize the chance of any other patient getting infected by coming in to be evaluated for their emergency. This being said, I want to ensure you that every possible thing is being done for your safety and that it is not dangerous to come to the emergency department if you feel like you are having an emergency, whatever that might be. There are a few simple things that each of you can do to make sure you and your family are safe. If you do go out in public, be sure to wear your mask in indoor spaces. Try to shop in bulk in order to limit the number of times you need to go to the store. Instead of multiple people, multiple people going to the store, try to limit it to one person to de decrease the chance of infection. Many stores have developed shopping hours for those over a certain age or those that are immunocompromised. Take advantage of this, if at all possible. If you have a family member that is willing to pick up groceries for you, this is the best option. Always social distance and make sure to continue being diligent with washing your hands. And this concludes the presentation. Feel free to reach out to me with any questions via email, which is listed below. And I hope you guys have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Hello, everyone. We hope you are enjoying the 50 and Better Health Fair. We are the Des Moines University Neurology Club, and we are going to be discussing the importance of sleep for healthy aging. Our topics will include the science of sleep, sleep needs as we age, the benefits of sleep for older individuals, as well as the risks of having a lack of sleep. Finally, we will conclude by discussing the role of sleep in fighting COVID-19 and how you can get a better night's sleep. Enjoy! Let's look at the science of sleep. There are two types of sleep, non-REM and REM. In general, Non-REM has four phases that contribute to the recovery of our body as we sleep and the building of our immune system. Regarding our memory, non-REM sleep helps gather our memories in a less organized way. REM sleep is what fine tunes the unorganized memories and assists us in consolidating our memories. During REM sleep is when we dream and during this time our voluntary muscles that we actively use every day are paralyzed so we do not jump out of bed and act out our dreams. Knowing this, you can see why it's important to reach the proper amount of sleep each night. If we lose out on one type of sleep, this could have negative effects on the recovery of our body and of our memory. We also have a rhythm that our bodies operate by. The more normal this rhythm is, the better sleep we will achieve. When it becomes dark out, our brain begins to produce chemicals that start to initiate the process of becoming tired so we can fall asleep at our normal time. There are other chemicals inside our brain that begin to build up as we are awake that also make us more tired to assist us in falling asleep when our bodies need to recover. As we age, our needs are always changing for sleep. It is crucial to get the recommended amount of sleep perform best, have a positive mood, and prevent illnesses. There is a great book by Matthew Walker who looks at why we sleep and refers to this in very understandable terms on unlocking the power of sleep and dreams and getting the amount of sleep that we need. We've talked about the basic science of sleep. Now let's talk about how sleep needs change as we age. As we get older, we need less and less sleep. Newborns require 16 to 20 hours of sleep. 
by the time a person becomes a young adult, he or she generally needs only seven to nine hours of sleep. Interestingly enough, seniors also usually need seven to nine hours of sleep. Unfortunately, there may be obstacles that prevent seniors from getting the sleep they need. One obstacle is that seniors generally have shorter periods of deep sleep, also known as slow wave sleep. That means that they sleep more lightly and tend to wake up more easily. Another obstacle is the influence of various underlying conditions. These underlying conditions can have a negative effect on sleep quality. Seven out of 10 adults have problems that affect the quality of their sleep. If you suspect that you might not be getting the sleep you need, talk to your primary care provider about whether seeing a sleep specialist would be the right choice for you. After seeing how our sleep can change as we age, it is important to emphasize that there are many benefits of getting a good night's sleep as we age as well. One of the biggest functions of sleep is to help consolidate our memory. Older adults who regularly get a good night's sleep report improved cognitive function overall, improved memory, and better mental health. This is important for preventing age-related cognitive decline and dementia as well as playing a role in preventing depression, which is a common mental health disorder among older individuals. There are also some benefits to our bodies as well as our minds. Older adults who report having good sleep at night tend to also be at lower risk for falls, which is a common cause of morbidity and mortality as we age. Additionally, good sleep has been shown to improve overall immune function and reduce risk of hospitalization in older adults. Fewer sick days and hospitalizations means more time doing the things that you enjoy. Chronic poor sleep affects our body and mind greatly. For example, it can increase the risk of dementia by 33%. It can also increase the risk of heart disease, type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, obesity, and age our brain 3 to 5 years. Most importantly, it can decrease our immunity which makes it hard for our body to fight off infections. We also are three times more likely to catch a cold. So let's fix our sleep and keep our body healthy. The risks of poor sleep are now more relevant than ever because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Since the start of the pandemic in the US, there has been a spike in the number of sleep disorders. Some sleep neurologists have described this disturbing phenomenon as COVID somnia. What's causing this to happen? Well, based on our current understanding, the main culprits seem to be mental health related, anxiety, depression, loneliness, and chronic stress. And a major challenge is that the problem seems to feed on itself. In other words, it's a vicious cycle. As we become stressed, we lose sleep. As we lose sleep, our immune system gets weaker. As our immune system gets weaker, we become more likely to get sick. And when we're more likely to get sick, we become more stressed. So what can we do to break this cycle and prevent the pandemic from ruining our sleep? We can start by avoiding things that stress us out, like distressing stories on the TV and on social media. We can practice relaxation exercises, try out meditation, and pursue enjoyable hobbies. Lastly, we can try to talk about our emotions and our concerns with a mental health expert who can offer us guidance and support. Okay, so now after hearing some important information on sleep, uh, it is time to talk about how to get a better night's rest. The first beneficial thing that you can do to get a good night's sleep is to maintain a regular bedtime and wake up time. Keeping a regular cycle allows you to fall asleep more easily as well as wake up feeling refreshed. Next, try to keep your sleep environment as cool, dark, and quiet as possible. This will improve sleep quality and reduce any distractions that may prevent you from falling asleep or that might wake you up in the middle of the night. Dim and turn off any unnecessary lights two hours prior to bed. Also try to remove or turn off any lights from electronics or other devices that you may have in your room. 
even the smallest amount of light can prevent you from falling asleep or hinder staying asleep. Try to avoid alcohol or caffeine before bed. It is recommended to not consume caffeine eight hours prior to bed to avoid restlessness. These two things can prevent you from falling asleep as well as affect the mechanisms in your brain that promote a good night's sleep and feeling refreshed in the morning. The next recommendation for a better night's sleep is to limit daytime naps to 10 to 20 minutes. While napping can increase your overall amount of rest, it can negatively impact your sleep quality at night if overdone. Exercise or being active during the day can promote a healthier mental state and bodily function that ultimately will help you sleep better. If you're still having trouble falling asleep or maintaining a regular sleep schedule, try taking one to two milligrams of melatonin approximately two hours prior to bed. This can trigger systems in your body that tell you it is time for bed. It's important to note, however, though, that melatonin is not a medication to put you to sleep, but rather it promotes the state of tiredness prior to bed. While it would be ambitious to implement all of these tips, even adding one or two of these could potentially help you get a better night's sleep. Thank you all for attending our presentation today. Here are some resources we use for preparing our slides. If you have questions or would like to learn more, please contact Des Moines University. Thank you. Well, hello everyone. My name is Sean Grambart. I'm an assistant professor as well as the assistant dean of academic affairs at Des Moines University within the College of Podiatric Medicine and Surgery. Uh, welcome to an ankle portion uh, when we're talking about uh, DMU being 50 and better. So the topic that I chose is total ankle replacement. This is something that's becoming more and more prevalent and there's quite a bit of new information that's uh, coming across as well as where we've gone from a historical perspective uh, regarding this particular procedure. When it comes to end stage ankle arthritis, this is a pretty unique disease. This is different than hip arthritis and knee arthritis. And there are a couple of reasons why when we talk about ankle arthritis, Oftentimes it's due to a traumatic injury, someone that broke their ankle, uh, some kind of cause. Uh, it could be rheumatoid arthritis, for example, uh, but usually it's due to a traumatic injury. Um, there's often adjacent deformity, which means maybe the ankle joint's not in perfect alignment. There can be an injury to the tibia uh, up or the leg bone itself. There can also be a injury to or a deformity of the joints below the ankle. And these surrounding joints, the joint below the ankle and the joint in front of the ankle can affect our surgical decisions as well compared to a hip or a knee, which are large joints with very minimal joints surrounding them. The age of the patient can be unique when we talk about ankle arthritis compared to hip and knee arthritis, and then what the expectations are. And all of this affects the way that we make our treatment decisions for patients. When we're talking hip and knee arthritis, the biggest difference is knee arthritis, for example, is a primary arthritis. This just occurs as time goes on. There's no associated factor with it. Uh, it is the most common primary arthritis. As you can see in this particular slide, post-traumatic osteoarthritis is very, very small percentage. Non-post-traumatic arthritis, meaning it just happens, is approximately 90%. So that's gonna be the difference when we talk about knee arthritis versus ankle arthritis. Ankle arthritis, almost 80% of arthritis that forms in the ankle is due to trauma, post-traumatic osteoarthritis, PTOA. Non-post-traumatic osteoarthritis is about the remaining 20.5%. And this can be due to uh, hemophilia, rheumatoid arthritis, different congenital conditions can cause this. So this is typically a secondary arthritis or one that occurs due to some type of event. And it takes uh, time to develop. Different fractures, when we talk about post-traumatic ankle osteoarthritis, 
it takes different amount of time. So when you look at these particular numbers, the malleolus is the inside ankle bone uh, or the outside ankle bone, for example. When we talk about fractures in time, we're talking a pretty significant amount of time, uh, months for this to develop, uh, years. So 35 months uh, with ligament instability, 25 months for it just to start to develop, and that can get worse as time goes on. So end-stage ankle arthritis is more of a disease of the young. More younger people injure their ankle, and as time goes on, you start to develop arthritis of it. So when we look at hip and knee arthritis, that average age is closer to 70. Ankle arthritis is a younger type of arthritic condition, closer to the age 55. And we know that there are millions of people, approximately two millions of people, two million of people visit their physician or surgeon due to ankle pain from either arthritis or from a fracture on an annual basis. So this kind of fits into the group that um, we're really looking at is that 50 and older patient, the younger patient that develops arthritis in their ankle. Oh, there's a small percentage of the, these patients that have normal alignment, and what we mean by normal alignment is it looks perfectly aligned. We don't have to do anything to realign it. You can see in this particular x-ray, as you look here, if we draw a line, you can see how you get this big bowing of the tibia coming down here. So that's a malalignment. We are usually doing some type of adjacent procedures to the joints or to the bone with ankle replacements. And that's rarely ever required with knee arthritis when you're doing a total knee replacement or a total hip replacement. And that's what makes the ankle arthritis more specialized. So hip and, hip and knee joint replacement surgeons typically do not do ankle replacements because it's such a unique type of joint that this is usually dealt with from a foot and ankle surgeon standpoint. And the, looking back on it years ago, and we're talking 15 to 20 years ago, the outcomes were less predictable. Now, as we've improved, which we'll talk about in a little bit, is we have more predictable outcomes that actually rival the numbers of, of hip and knee replacement. So we are getting better as time goes on. At this point, we're equal to what hip and knee replacements do from a predictability standpoint. There are a couple of different options when you have ankle arthritis that is not common in the hip and knee. So the gold standard that we talk about is fusion. An ankle fusion is when you put the ankle together, let's say if you have significant arthritis, the gold standard that we've been doing for years and years and years is fusing the ankle together. So you will lose mobility of the ankle joint, but by not having a joint, you won't have arthritis. Ankle arthroplasty or ankle replacement is the newer option and realistically it's several decades old at this point but it's a more common option at this point and we have seen outcomes comparing ankle fusion or ankle arthrodesis to ankle replacement and they have identical very very similar patient outcomes according to the latest literature on it so this is an example of an ankle fusion um, you can see if you look at, so the ankle joint would be right across this area here. With arthritis, you have a plate that comes across this area and screws here and here that have fused the ankle together. So the gold standard for years has been make the tibia or the leg bone and the talus or the ankle bone one bone to eliminate the joint. And that has worked for uh, years, especially prior to the success of ankle replacements. But now we've got the ability to actually look at replacing the joint. So you can see we have two different ankle replacements here. You have the metal piece that goes into the tibia or the leg bone here and here. You have the piece that sits on the talus. Uh, Consider the talus the bone. I kind of call it the quarterback of the team because it allows the foot to move up and down and side to side. So here's the component on the talus, and then you have this 
ultra high molecular weight polyethylene piece that goes in between the two components. That's kind of like a brake pad. And we'll talk about this in a little bit, but that's a piece that at times you have to replace every once in a while. But that's the newer options that we have. And we basically got to ink replacements because if you do a Dr. Google search, as I like to call it, people aren't happy when they have an ankle fusion because they lose motion. There are some people that ankle fusion is 100% indicated for, that I wouldn't even recommend an ankle replacement. But there are some people in which an ankle replacement is an option. So if you fuse the ankle, you're going to lose motion across there. And that puts stress on adjacent joints, and people aren't happy that they lose the motion. Ankle fusions also have a fairly high non-union rate. And what that means is the bones don't fuse together, which can be a pretty problematic complication. You can see on the CT scan here, the joint line is still visible. So a non-union can be painful. You typically don't get that with an ankle replacement. And you can get increased juxtarticular or increased arthritis, the joints below the ankle here and the joint in, joints in front of the ankle. So you will put more stress on those particular joints. So what's changed? Well, the biggest things that changed is we are getting better with ankle replacements. Technology has improved significantly. You can look at the ankle replacement that we were putting back in the 1970s. You have a component in the talus. You have this kind of polyethylene piece in the tibia, and that's it. To compared to where, where we are now, 2009, we have these solid pieces that hold up well. There's that question of ankle fusion remaining the gold standard. More and more studies have shown that they have very similar patient satisfaction rates from an outcome standpoint, and we know that the ankle replacement maintains motion, so we're seeing more and more patients that are happier with the results from the ankle replacement. Sometimes, um, and you can see here, here's a fusion that successfully, successfully healed, but we had to take down the outside ankle bone to actually access that. And that's been going on for years and years and years. There's a sample of a replacement. The newer ones where we use smaller components that go into the leg bone or the tibia, so we're not having to resect as much bone. So the history behind it, we've been doing ankle replacements for more than 40 years. Um, early 70s is when the first ones came out, they had a high, high, high failure rate, okay? It's greater than 50% failure rate, did not hold up well. And now we've gone through multiple generations to improve um, the design of it, which has made it last longer and become more predictable. So with an ankle replacement or a TAR, total ankle replacement, the question that will always get asked, can you really salvage motion? Can you get motion back? And the primary purpose to do an ankle replacement is to alleviate pain, okay, hands down. If you say, why are we doing this? We are doing it to eliminate the bone-on-bone -bone arthritic pain. Post-op motion depends on how much stiffness you have before surgery. So if you have a very, very stiff ankle joint where you have so much arthritis, it really doesn't move that well, those are patients that I would recommend an ankle fusion because you're, you're functioning with the fusion to begin with. However, if you do have motion there, an ankle replacement will give you what you have in a little bit more. So you actually get closer to normal motion with an ankle replacement once it heals uh, properly. So that's where the the key is. Our first generation ones, just to go through a little history, we don't do these anymore. You can see these are very, very old pictures of it. I took one out probably 15 years ago, and uh, I'm still trying to find the picture of it. It just kind of fell out of someone's ankle, but it actually lasted for almost 25 years in this patient. So I would consider that a success, but these are were very, very unpredictable. The second generation, uh, these came around in the late 80s, uh, or excuse me, uh, mid 90s, um, and lasted till the early 2000s. You can see we had multiple screws. You had these big components that went across the outside ankle bone and the inside ankle bone. Um, they helped, but they had a tendency to be a little bit unstable. They loosened a little bit. So we probably saw about 75% success rate with these. 
The third generation is more stable components. This is where we made a huge leap forward, where we're seeing 92 to 94% success rate with these. We get bony ingrowth within this metal component. This is the tibial component on top, Taylor component on the bottom. There's that plastic piece or the ultra high molecular weight polyethylene that goes in between. And the bone actually grows into the components now. That's what those little pores, kind of the rough surfaces are meant to do. We have ones that can go up into the tibia and that's for more stability. We can do it for deformity correction as well. So we really have made significant improvement with these. Our fourth generation or the newer ones that are out now are made of a different ultra uh, light poly, uh, polyethylene. It's a significant improvement. It's stronger. It creates less wear and tear. So we don't have to replace those as much. The biggest thing that we've seen is CT planning. So we can actually make custom guides to help for an individual patient. We can take a CT scan and develop a custom guide for that particular patient. So this is an example of what it looks like. After we get a CT scan, we can make a, an, exact, an exact design that when we are in the operating room, we have, so this is the sample of the tibia and this is a sample of the talus that's made from the CT and that's actually in the operating room with me. And then we create this custom made cutting jig to help line everything up. So everyone is different. This 15979 uh, is specific for a single patient. And we can put this directly on the patient to help prepare our cuts. So this is a very, very, very precise cutting guide. It has cut down the operating room time significantly and has improved our outcomes tremendously with this. Before, anchor placements would take about three hours. If you get into an experienced surgeon's hand, they take about an hour. So the ideal patient, 50 years old, low physical demands. These are not patients that want to get back to running marathons. These are patients that would like to walk to golf, work in the garden, walk their dogs. That's what we're looking for. Um, they're healthy, they have reasonable weight, they have good alignment, and they've got good blood flow. Patients that are not ideal are patients that have deformity, um, that is significant, uh, severe, severe malalignment, diabetic patients that can't feel we don't do these on neuromuscular problems uh, where we know there's going to be increased deformity as time goes on and if you have poor blood flow okay so this patient was done at an outside facility they put it in on this type of deformity and now we have this mess to clean up so there are ideal patients and there are patients that are definitely contraindicated for this particular surgery so poor skin, if you have trauma that we don't have a healthy soft tissue to make an incision, we won't do it on. Circulation is another big thing. And age, we try not to do it on young, young patients because we know that it's not going to hold up as time goes on. So the pros of ankle replacements, we can get close to normal range of motion. Um, we can decrease the pain. You're able to move up and down more. The cons is you're gonna probably have to have multiple surgeries. You have your first surgery, you get the components in, and then that plastic piece or the brake pad is probably gonna have to be replaced at some point. About every 10 to 15 years, you're gonna have to put a new one in. So you're going to have to have maintenance procedures. You can get subsidence where the components will start to slide down and you may have to convert it to an ankle fusion, which is a huge procedure, and then the recovery is significantly different. I think that's the biggest thing is when people come in and said, oh, I've had a hip replacement done or I've had a knee replacement done, an ankle replacement is totally different. Hip and knee replacements, the, those joint specialists get you moving basically that day. With an ankle replacement, you are typically non-wapering on it for four to six weeks, similar to a fracture, and you're in a walking boot for another four to six weeks. So it takes time to recover from this one. It's not immediate weight bearing. And we oftentimes will have to stage this where we'll have to do multiple procedures to realign the hind foot and then put the ankle in as well.
So here's a case. You can see a pretty straightforward ankle replacement. That spot in between is where the plastic piece or the polyethylene sits. Here's one where we added a subtalar joint fusion because there's arthritis underneath it. And we have nice alignment here, so that's going to have full motion up and down. Uh, this is one, this is a non-union of an ankle fusion. That, so the ankle fusion did not heal properly. We were able to convert it to an ankle replacement. That can be done at times as well. Here's one with some malalignment. You can see the angular deformity here where it comes out to the side. We can actually realign it by cutting into the tibia. And then this is a stage procedure, so we realign the long bone of the leg to make it nice and straight. And then we put the ankle replacement in afterwards, after a couple months to allow that to heal. So in conclusion, uh, ankle replacement is definitely, in, there are more and more being done. We are getting very good at them. Um, and an experienced surgeon will do very well with these. And they'll tell you if you're a candidate for it or if you're not. Uh, we look for the perfect patient. We look for that over 50, someone that just wants to do low impact activities. Uh, we do uh, plan for multiple surgeries with this because we know we will likely have to do some maintenance procedures on it. I would consider an ankle fusion if you're a one and done person. If you don't want multiple surgeries, ankle fusion, is something that you should do instead, or if you have very, very, very limited range of motion, you're better off with an ankle fusion. Um, ankle fusions, one and done. Ankle replacement is multiple surgeries, and that's a big, big key as people look to this particular procedure. And that is all I have for you. So. Uh, hopefully, if you have any questions about this or if you think you're a candidate or just even like to discuss some ankle pain that you have, please feel free to contact Des Moines University Foot and Ankle, and we can certainly give you some options on it. Uh, so thank you for your time. On behalf of the Podiatric Medicine Advocacy Club here on campus at Des Moines University, I would like to welcome you all to the Virtual 50 and Better Fair here on November 7th, 2020, our topic of discussion is going to be hemoglobin A1C. A little bit about podiatric medicine advocacy. We're a club that was founded in 2014 in Des Moines University, and our mission is to inform the community of the roles and values of podiatric medicine as a profession, to promote the idea of equivalence amongst other professions in healthcare, and to educate health interested students on the benefits of becoming a foot and ankle specialist. You can see a few pictures on this slide of certain events that we have done on campus and through the community that showcases our work. Today, PMA will be discussing the importance of hemoglobin A1c. So to start off, let's talk about what exactly is hemoglobin A1c. Hemoglobin A1c is a test that measures the amount of blood sugar or glucose over the past two to three months. Hemoglobin, or HB as it's commonly abbreviated, is a protein found in red blood cells. It's the agent that's responsible for carrying oxygen throughout your body and supplying the tissues. It gives blood its red color as well. When glucose builds up in your blood through diet or from bodily secretions, it binds to hemoglobin in your red blood cells. A1C is also known as glycated protein, and that's why this is a test that measures how much glucose is bound. The normal range for hemoglobin A1C is considered between 4 to 5.6%. So what exactly happens if your hemoglobin A1c level is over 5.6%? This can be indicative of diabetes, heart disease, or liver disease. The higher your hemoglobin A1c is, the higher your risk of having complications related to diabetes. On the little diagram displayed on the right side of this PowerPoint slide, you can see that anything considered 5.7 or below is normal. Anything between ranges 5.7 to 6.4 is considered pre-diabetic, and anything 6.5 is or higher is considered diabetic. If hemoglobin A1c is not regulated, it can lead to a variety of different complications. Some of them are listed on this slide. The first being diabetic neuropathy, which is a condition in which you have nerve damage commonly associated with diabetes. Retinopathy is also a condition that's going to be affecting the retina of the eye, and it's also commonly associated with diabetes. Nephropathy is disease associated with the kidneys. Cardiovascular diseases or heart disease and poor wound healing. 
here are some pictures displaying these complications. So on the top, you can see that heart diagram and you can see that there's some black tissue or necrotic tissue indicative of cardiovascular disease. On the bottom left, you can see um, a picture of someone's eye and you can see that there's been some damage to the vessels and that is common um, with retinopathy, which is commonly associated with diabetes as well. The last two pictures of the feet ulcerations show poor wound healing commonly associated with diabetes as well. The next thing we would like to talk about is treatment and prevention on how to make your hemoglobin A1C values better. The first three things to hit on are going to be lifestyle modifications. Diet is super important for health and it should include a full serving of fruits and vegetables as well as whole grains, fats, carbohydrates, and protein. Your PCP or healthcare provider will give you further instructions on recommendations that they think you should include based on your personal clear plan as well. Furthermore, you should also engage in exercise around two to three times a week at 30 minute intervals each time. And in doing so, this can be activities such as simple cardio like walks around the neighborhood or a light jog. You could also do some strength training or weight training or any other activity that gets your heart rate going a little bit more. Additionally, you wanna make sure that you're taking your medications as advised. Make sure you're telling your provider about any herbal remedies, over-the-counter medications, as well as prescribed medications so that they know exactly what you're on and how they can help further in treatment. Additionally, you wanna make sure to check your hemoglobin A1C with your primary care physician every two to three months if you have high blood sugar or at any other annual physical exam that you do once a year. If you are diabetic, schedule a regular checkup with your local podiatrist for any wound infections as well. On behalf of PMA, I just want to take this moment to thank you all for viewing our presentation. We hope we were able to provide you with valuable information about hemoglobin A1c and give you insight on why it's so important to monitor your blood sugar levels. Thank you for your time and enjoy the rest of your day. At Des Moines University Clinic Foot and Ankle, our expert providers provide comprehensive care for older adults who often have compounded foot and ankle issues. The Foot and Ankle Clinic has the largest group of board certified podiatric physicians in central Iowa. As a teaching clinic, we're training the next group of podiatric physicians, which means that our clinic offers the most advanced care in foot and ankle possible. Doctors of podiatric medicine are specialists in the diagnosis, treatment, and care of lower extremity disorders, diseases, and injuries. Our physicians diagnose and treat conditions such as ulcers, tumors, fractures, skin and nail diseases, injuries, as well as deformities and conditions such as weak feet and foot imbalances. We use innovative methods to treat many conditions such as ingrown toenails, calluses, fractures, other injuries, as well as arch problems and bone disorders. At Foot and Ankle, we offer thorough consultations for both preventative care as well as diagnosis and treatment of many conditions involving the foot and ankle. No matter what foot and ankle issue you're dealing with, know that a team of specialists here at Des Moines University Clinics is willing and ready to help with whatever needs you may have. Where can you find comprehensive medical services, expert clinicians, newly renovated spaces, and a breathtaking view all in one location? Only at the Des Moines University Clinic. Call today or visit dmu.edu slash clinic.
Hello and welcome to the Student Osteopathic Orthopedic Association's presentation on common orthopedic problems for the 50 and Better Health Fair. My name is Jake Rogers. I'm the association's current president, and I, along with my board members, Jacob Frisbee, Ben Jacobs, and Taylor Keller, will be discussing common orthopedic problems that are seen in the 50 and Better population. Today we will be talking about rheumatoid arthritis, carpal tunnel syndrome, osteoarthritis, joint replacement, and low back pain. Our first topic today is rheumatoid arthritis. RA is an autoimmune disease, meaning the immune system is attacking the body rather than foreign invaders. Abnormal immune cells create antibodies that stick to things they shouldn't. This will result in soft tissue, cartilage, and bone destruction. So in sum, RA is a condition of joint destruction accompanied by damage to the heart, lungs, kidneys, blood vessels, and other organs. It most commonly affects the hands and feet, but it can also affect the knees, spine, elbows, ankles, and the shoulders. So what causes rheumatoid arthritis? The initial cause is unclear, but there are known factors that increase the risk of developing RA. Females are two to three times more likely to develop RA than males, which is true for most autoimmune conditions. The risk increases with age, with the most common age of onset being 40 to 60 years old. Obesity increases the risk of developing RA. And smoking not only increases the risk of developing RA, but it can also make the condition more severe. Rheumatoid arthritis can be treated with operative or non-operative methods. The operative methods depend on the specific case and the deformities that are present. These methods are not as common as they used to be, though, because of advances in medications to not only treat the symptoms, but also to slow the progression of the disease. Non-operative methods are based in medications. The first-line therapies include steroids, NSAIDs like Aleve or ibuprofen, and even some chemotherapy drugs and drugs used to treat malaria have been found to be effective. The second line therapies include disease modifying anti rheumatoid drugs or DMARDs. These are our heavy hitters and they attack the dysfunctional immune system to treat the underlying condition and slow the progression of the disease. Carpal tunnel syndrome is caused by compression of the median nerve at the wrist joint. The median nerve travels down the arm and through a passage in the wrist called the carpal tunnel. When this area is irritated or inflamed, the surrounding structures compress the median nerve and cause numbness and tingling in the hand. Though there is no definite cause, the condition is thought to be related to repetitive motions of the wrist. Pregnancy, diabetes, obesity, and many other health conditions are also thought to increase the risk of this syndrome. This condition is present in up to 5% of the US population with a higher prevalence in females, and a peak age between 40 and 60 years old. Symptoms include numbness, tingling, shocking sensations, and hand weakness. This condition also commonly presents with the patient being woken up at night with these symptoms. This condition is often diagnosed clinically based on the symptoms the patient presents with. Doctors can also perform a nerve test called an EEG to test the function of the median nerve. There are a wide range of treatments for this condition. Non-operative management includes the use of nighttime splints, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, and steroid injections into the carpal tunnel. There is also a surgical option where the transverse carpal ligament is released, relieving the pressure on the median nerve. Some items that may prevent carpal tunnel syndrome includes avoiding repetitive movements, taking breaks from typing, and wearing a brace during repetitive wrist activities. Osteoarthritis is the most common type of arthritis. It's estimated that about 32 and a half million Americans suffer from osteoarthritis, and it's the result of cartilage breakdown between the bones, which is due to normal everyday wear and tear. Some risk factors that may make you predisposed to the development of osteoarthritis are being over the age of 60 years old, obesity, 
any type of trauma. Your genetics can put you at a higher risk for osteoarthritis, and it is more common in females. So how do you know if you have osteoarthritis? The general symptoms of osteoarthritis are joint pain, stiffness, and swelling. And these, this is usually seen in the weight-bearing joints of the hip, the knee, and the lower lumbar spine. Uh, typically, the symptoms improve with rest, and they're usually worse at the end of the day. Now, if you do have osteoarthritis, there's a few things you can do to help improve your everyday pain. The first of which is lifestyle changes. As I mentioned before, obesity is a major risk factor for the development of osteoarthritis and incorporating some healthy lifestyle changes like exercising, losing some weight, and having eat healthy eating habits can really help improve um, this arthritic pain. Additionally, medications can help improve this pain. Uh, you can do some over-the-counter painkillers in addition to prescription. However, it's always best discussed with uh, your primary care physician as to what medications are best for you. Additionally, you can also uh, look into knee injections. Um, this will help lubricate and cushion the joint and help alleviate some of that pain. And if all of these, if you've tried knee injections and medications and incorporating lifestyle changes into your life and you still have not experienced pain relief, you can look into the possibility of having a total joint replacement as a last resort option. Joint replacements are typically a last resort therapy for people with, arth with arthritis. And these are fairly common procedures. Approximately 1 million Americans will have joint replacement surgery every year. If you look on the right hand side, you can see a depiction of a both, both of a knee and a hip. The knee is on the top, the hip is on the bottom, uh, with arthritic damage. And it shows how this, this can be kind of replaced with a, a metal or plastic implant. This implant is used with the goal of reducing pain and if the surgery is done successfully, generally it improves the quality of life. And these replacements have been getting better um, recently and, and uh, it's estimated that most people that get total joint replacements now, uh, these replacements will typically last about 20 years before they go away. So how do you know if uh, getting a joint replacement is right for you? Uh, the best thing to do is to have a conversation with a physician, with your primary care physician and an orthopedic surgeon to see if you are a, a good fit uh, for a joint replacement. And some questions that you can ask yourself prior to these meetings are, can you do the things that you enjoy doing? Do you, uh, do you get any pain relief with any medications that you're taking? Can you sleep through the night without waking up due to pain? And last of which is, does your pain prevent you from doing daily activities? I mean, can you get into and out of a car uh, without significant pain or into and out of a chair without significant pain? And if you answer yes to any or all of these, it could be a, a time to talk to a physician to see if you're a candidate for surgery. Hello, this is Ben Jacobs, and I'll be taking you through our last orthopedic topic of the day, which is low back pain. So low back pain has a variety of causes and along with those causes has a variety of symptoms. So we'll be covering those on the next slide. Um, as you can guess, low back pain is not an exclusive orthopedic issue. So many different medical specialties will be involved in the treatment and care of, of this uh, clinical presentation. So the prevalence of low back pain is, is very high, 84% um, of the uh, world population will have a bout of low back pain at some point in their life, um, whereas 26% have had at least one day of low back pain in the last three months. Some risk factors include smoking, obesity, increasing of age, and then we do see a slight increase in the amount of females that present with low back pain over males. So over the wide variety of causes that I was talking about earlier. We have nonspecific low back pain, which constitutes about 85% of the cases. Uh, we have serious systemic low back pain, which is less than 1%, and those are gonna be your really debilitating diseases. Um, and then 
it is classified as less serious. I use quotes there for a reason, but very specific um, causes of low back pain uh, constitute just under 10% of the total cases. Of the non-specific cases, uh, most of them will resolve in one week, usually without uh, the help of a physician. Um, your symptoms for this are going to be general, dull, aching pain. Uh, these won't necessarily completely debilitate you from doing activities uh, you would normally do in your daily life, but they, they might make them a bit more difficult. Of our serious systemic low back pain causes, we have spinal cord compression, which is usually caused by a disc herniation. Um, these symptoms are broken down based on how long the disease has prevailed in the body. So early signs are just going to be a general pain. You're not going to be able to uh, narrow that pain down to a specific location. Um, midway through the course of this disease progression, you're going to see muscle weakness. Um, and late, you're going to start seeing bowel and bladder incontinence. Second cause, that's a serious systemic cause, would be metastatic cancer. Um, many types of cancer will metastasize to the vertebral bodies uh, preferentially over other bone in the body, um, and especially within multiple myeloma, we see 60% of patients will have these uh, bone mets. Uh, these will be denoted with a sudden pain. Um, it could indicate a fracture, but this is going to be a lot more localizable. And the last of our serious systemic is going to be our vertebral osteomyelitis. This is just a very nonspecific term that indicates an infection of the vertebrae. We're not sure what's the cause of it, but uh, this one is specific in the sense that you will feel pain, extreme pain, with uh, pressure to your lower back. And finally is our less serious but specific causes. This includes a compression fracture. Um, a compression fracture can happen for a variety of reasons. Um, usually falls are the biggest uh, indicator. Um, and this can have a big range of symptoms depending on the etiology of the fracture. So this can be no pain to completely immobilizing you. Our second would be radiculopathy. This is damage or just impingement to spinal nerve roots, but the more serious um, issue would be damage. Um, and this is going to have that sharp zinging um, electrical pain down a specific body segment. Uh, in low back pain, you're usually going to see this down the legs. Uh, we refer to this as sciatica. And finally, we have spinal stenosis. Um, spinal stenosis is caused when you have a slipping of a vertebral body um, due to a fracture, due to laxity in ligaments. Um, so you're going to feel pain in your lower legs when walking. And this one has a classic sign um, that's associated. It's called the shopping cart sign. And this is where your pain is usually relieved when you're sitting or when you're bending over. So think of a person at a grocery store um, who will be significantly hunched over their shopping cart in order to just go on with their daily routine. And this is not an exhaustive list by any means. Um, some other causes include uh, ankylosing spondylitis, osteoarthritis, which we talked about earlier, um, there's scoliosis. There's a ton of psychologic issues that can manifest as low back pain. Um, piriformis syndrome and sacroiliac joint dysfunction as well. So after we've talked about all of these different causes, the real question becomes is when to see a physician. So I've kind of broken this down on different tiers that kind of correlate with a lot of the disease progression we just talked about. Um, so your normal state should be no pain. I can't stress that enough is that normal is no pain. Our next step is abnormal, which is any amount of pain. Um, so any amount of pain should be monitored closely, um, watch it day by day, see if it's getting better or worse, watch it to see if it's getting better or worse with different motions or if it's hurting when it's stationary. All of these things are good things to take note of. Um, when to see your physician, if this pain persists for longer than six weeks, that's about the time point that we're saying, okay, we want to see you in, um, this could be bad and we want to catch it early or it could be nothing, but either way, peace of mind, um, head in at six weeks. Um, any pain associated with recent trauma, trauma could be uh, a fall, could be a motor vehicle crash, um, anything of that nature. If you have any numbness or tingling, that's something to definitely take a note of and definitely bring up to your physician. Um, any difficulty walking, bowel, bladder incontinence, and then pain that wakes you up from your sleep are all indicators of kind of an advanced disease progression and you would definitely wanna get in to see your physician as soon as possible.
On behalf of the Student Osteopathic Orthopedic Association, thanks for watching. Hi everyone, thank you so much for tuning into the 50 and Better Fair this year. This presentation will be on bone health and osteoporosis, and it was created by the Internal Medicine Club here at DMU. So to start off with, what is osteoporosis? Osteoporosis is when bones become more brittle and more prone to fracture due to decreased density of the components that make up bones. This can happen in any bone in your body, but most often manifests as a hip fracture or vertebral fracture. This can occur just with age, just the normal wear and tear on the body. This also occurs with hormone changes in the body. For instance, post-menopause, women will have less estrogen in their body, and estrogen is really important for um, bone health and bone strength. Another example would be less testosterone with age. So why is bone health important? Well, increased risk of fracture makes the potential of the results of a fall much more dangerous. So Unhealthy bones are at a much higher risk of fracture and something that might have just normally been a really minor slip or maybe you caught yourself on the wall as you tripped can turn into a fracture which potentially could lead to a surgery or a hospitalization and otherwise an, in a disruption of daily life. So keeping bones healthy allows for the continuation of daily life activities, which is really important to all of us. When to see your doctor about bone health or osteoporosis? Well, following a fall, it's very important to see your doctor. Make sure you don't have any fractures that have been undetected. Um, it's also really important to talk to your doctor if you have any explained back pain. This could be due to a vertebral fracture you didn't know you obtained um, or any other fracture that it just might be hiding. It's really, really important to have your annual, annual physical every year and be sure to, even if you have no um, evidence of a fracture or any um, thing that's, that's gone wrong with your health, it's really important to have that annual physical. And at this physical, be sure to discuss any family history of osteoporosis or any new risk factors you might have. So I wanted to discuss um, some abnormal findings that you might encounter when you're at the doctor's office. Um, if you were to get screened for osteoporosis um, to just check up on your on your bone health. So a few things that you might hear about um, or you might see the values recorded would be, first of all, a dual energy absorptiometry scan. This is often called the DEXA scan. This scan measures bone density. So a, a DEXA scan gives a T-score and an abnormal DEXA scan would be a T-score of negative 2.5 or below in the lumbar spine, so that's your lower back, the femoral neck, which is the neck of your femur bone, or your hip. If your physician were to find that you have a DEXA scan that's negative 2.5 or below for a T-score, they might help you with some um, supplementation or some prevention methods to make sure that um, they can hopefully resolve your, the bone density issues so that they can maybe prevent any fractures. Um, because again, a DEXA scan is all about measuring bone density and decreased bone density is what can lead to um, an increased risk of fractures from really minor traumas. Another value you might see um, recorded at the um, doctor's office would be 25-hydroxyvitamin D. So this is a, um, a hormone that's found in your serum, and it's found after another version of vitamin D has been modified in your body. So it's, if your physician were to find that this level was below 30 nanograms per milliliter, that would be concerning. We want 25-hydroxyvitamin D to be between 30 and 50 nanograms per milliliter. This might indicate um, that you have a vitamin D deficiency, and vitamin D is incredibly important in bone health and maintaining bone strength. So if um, your physician were to measure 25-hydroxyvitamin D um, and find a low value, they may also help you with some supplementation, some prevention methods. Um, that just may be one way they measure your bone health. Another thing you may be discussing with your physician would be a fragility fracture. So this is um, defined by the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists as a fracture that is due to a fall involving a force similar to the force of falling from a standing position that would not have fractured a healthy bone. So like I mentioned earlier, this could be um, just kind of falling into a chair or um, tripping and falling into a wall but catching yourself. Things that are really, really minor traumas that generally wouldn't fracture a bone but did happen to fracture a bone at this instance. So if you had an x-ray done and found um, 
a fracture that you don't remember getting, this could be um, a fragility fracture. And this could be a sign that you maybe have decreased bone density and maybe some osteoporosis. Another thing that kind of goes along with that is any unexplained pain for minimal trauma or daily life activities could indicate that there is um, a fracture that is that is hidden somewhere in your body um, that's just kind of being masked by um, something. So I want to talk a little bit about how to know if you're at risk. Um, the age threshold for the risk of osteoporosis is age 65 and above. Anyone who's had fry, prior fractures um, should have is a little bit more at risk for osteoporosis and should have that um, worked up by their doctor. Um, early menopause is a risk factor, and this is because early menopause would just indicate that there had been a longer amount of time that a woman hadn't had um, the normal amounts of estrogen in her body, which again is really important for bone health and bone strength. A low body weight, which is defined as less than 127 pounds. Rheumatoid arthritis, decreased kidney function, and this is because the kidneys are really important for the conversion of um, different, like vitamin D for instance, or different hormones, so decreased kidney function could have implications on bone health. Um, malabsorption conditions, sustained use of glucocorticoids, and these would include things like prednisone or hydrocortisone, and then hyperparathyroidism. Now I want to talk a little bit about some prevention methods. So according to the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, um, alcohol intake is an important prevention method. So they define it as no more than three drinks per day. They also talk about avoiding smoking or smoking cessation. Another um, really great way to prevent osteoporosis, and that's often in a, um, control for a lot of people, is an active lifestyle. So it's things like weight-bearing exercise, things like walking, jogging, um, balance or resistance training. Tai Chi is a really popular um, exercise activity that's weight-bearing and that can be very beneficial for bone health. Um, stair climbing is often recommended, or even things just like posture exercises to make sure that um, you're strengthening your back muscles so you can um, help out your bones as much as possible and um, hopefully avoid any, any fractures in your back. So some more prevention methods. Dietary calcium intake is incredibly important um, in keeping your bones strong and healthy. So specifically, the recommendation for women ages 50 to 71 is 1,200 milligrams of calcium per day. For men ages 50 to 71, the recommendation is 1,000 milligrams of calcium per day. And then for both men and women ages 71 and older, the recommendation is 1,200 milligrams of calcium per day. So you can obtain this in your diet um, from any dairy products, things like milk, cheese, or cottage cheese. Nuts and seeds are also very calcium rich. So that picture on the right kind of gives some good examples of um, some calcium rich foods. Another really important method for prevention is vitamin D3 supplementation. So specifically, it's recommended 1,000 to 2,000 international units. Another way to get vitamin D3 besides in your diet, and that's free, is it from the sun. So taking a walk outside maybe two to three times a week would help you get some more of that vitamin D3 and would also help um, with the exercise component of bone strength and keeping your bones healthy. Beyond that, adequate protein intake is also very important. So the recommendation for protein is 0.8 milligrams per kilogram. And then lastly, limiting caffeine is also really important. So keeping that to one to two drinks per day um, because this will increase your ability to absorb calcium. So I want to note before moving on from this slide that it is always extremely, extremely important that you talk to your doctor before you begin any supplement. So if you're on any supplements at all or on any multivitamins or anything like that, it's very important that your doctor knows before you start any new supplements. If you were to increase your calcium intake, um, this could possibly interfere with any medications you may be taking. So it's very important your doctor knows before you start a new supplement or if you're on one now or anything like that. That's all I've got for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, if you'd like any more information on bone health or osteoporosis, a couple websites I've listed here um, in the Office on Women's Health in the United States Department of Health and Human Services. There is the website there. And then the Mayo Clinic website is another great resource for prevention, when to see your doctor, um, dietary supplements, all things related to bone health you can find there. Or again, just talk with your doctor. They should be able to help you design a plan that fits just right for your lifestyle and just right for your health. Here are my references and thank you so much again for tuning in and enjoy the rest of the 50 and better fair this year.
Welcome to the Fall Prevention Presentation by the Physical Therapy Club. Make safety your call to prevent a fall. The definition of a fall is an uncontrolled descent. So it still counts as a fall if you catch yourself or even if it's something as simple as plopping down on a chair. Falls among adults age 65 and older are common, costly, and preventable. Falls are the leading cause of fatal and non-fatal injuries among older adults. Falls among adults age 65 and older are very costly. Each year, about $50 billion is spent on medical costs related to non-fatal fall injuries and $754 million is spent related to fatal falls. Falls can lead to broken bones, head injuries, and the fear of falling. On this slide, we're going to discuss tips to prevent falls. The first tip being scheduling an appointment with your doctor. When you meet with your doctor, you can discuss medications and other risk factors that are specific to yourself. Also, we would advise you to meet with your eye doctor so you can screen your eyesight annually. Another tip is to keep moving. Strength and other balance exercises are important in fall prevention, and we will discuss this later on in the presentation. We also encourage you to evaluate your environment. Things like lighting and your sh specific shoes will be important in fall prevention. We would also encourage you to educate yourself on the different ways that you can be put at risk for a fall. There are some risk factors that can be modified to decrease the chance of falls. This includes balance impairment, gait, muscle weakness, and the use of certain medications. So what can you do to prevent yourself from falling? A simple daily mobility and strengthening program will be important to prevent yourself from falling. This can be something like an exercise class, such as Tai Chi, or it can be as simple as taking your dog for a walk. A physical therapist can identify the exercises best for you after completing an evaluation. Here are a few sample exercises beneficial for improving balance. Heel raises can be done holding on to a chair or counter as shown. You can also challenge your balance by practicing positions such as tandem stance, shown in the middle picture. Always do these with a stable surface nearby. Finally, strengthening your muscles through repeated sit to stands can also reduce fall risk. Being proactive is the best approach to fall prevention. A physical therapist can help you learn the correct way to fall. When you practice the correct way to fall, you will be prepared and educated in the case of an unprecedented circumstance. These are our references. Thank you for listening to this presentation and we hope you were able to learn something new. Hello, I am Dr. Carrie Smith and I'm a physical therapist in the Department of Physical Therapy. And today we're gonna to be talking about the central control of the core and bladder function. So to begin with a little about myself, I said that I work in the Department of Physical Therapy and I also have a clinical practice in pelvic health at the Des Moines University Clinic. I'm the clinic manager and I love to do community education, especially on the pelvic floor, which many people don't have a lot of um, background knowledge about how to keep it strong and the normal functions of this essential organ. And I'm also a very proud alumni, along with my husband, Kevin, and here is our um, family of three boys. So one of the central themes as we start learning about aging and just keeping strong is we talk about control. We wanna have control of our balance, we need to have our strength and mobility, but we also want to have bladder control. That is certainly an essential function that we all want to maintain with our aging process. So let's start off. What are your perceptions? What are your perceptions as far as, is urinary incontinence a normal part of aging? Do you feel like nothing can be done to improve bladder function in older adults? 
And would you seek treatment if it did not involve surgery or medications? Hopefully through this presentation, we might be able to provide a little education and possibly change your perceptions on the bladder function. So let's talk about normal bladder control. Again, do you take your time going to the bathroom after you awaken in the morning? Do you go to the bathroom during the day when you want? How about being able to sit through a meeting, movie, or road trip without thinking about your bladder? Do you sleep through the night or wake up only once to urinate? How about the sensation of having to pee? Does that cause anxiety for you? And you should have no leaking at any time. Even after you've had a baby, even if you're doing a jumping jack, even if you've had surgery. Those are all things that I've listed here are things that we can hope to have as normal bladder control. Now for many people, those we, we have weakness and we might have leakage and we'll talk about that today. But the thing is, is that it can be corrected and many people are, are just not aware of those as treatment options. So who is affected? This is a picture as you can see, there's children, there's teenagers, there's active athletes, there's younger, older, there's grandparents, there's new moms, there's um, middle-aged. So I hope you get the idea that it can impact any of us. So what are bladder control program problems? First, we might have leakage. There might be a urinary urgency and frequency that we just can't control or that it interrupts your lifestyle. Maybe it's incomplete emptying, that after you go, you just still feel like you have to empty some more. Or nocturia is like when you have to go at night, or maybe there's retention. Those are all bladder control problems that we also treat in physical therapy, um, bowel incontinence, constipation, pelvic pain. Um, all of those can be a part of your pelvic floor problems. So urinary incontinence, just a few definitions. It is defined as any involuntary leakage of urine. It doesn't mean that you're continent unless you do these activities or you've had these different his, the, these things in your history. Incontinence is any voluntary leakage of urine. So there's a couple of different types that we're gonna talk about. Stress urinary incontinence is when that involuntary leakage occurs with activities. So it can be running, jumping, could be coughing, sneezing, picking up a grandchild. So really it's due to any increase in abdominal pressure that's relative to the urethra. So the urethra cannot handle the additional pressure that's pushing down on it and you leak. And then there's urinary, or, I'm sorry, urge urinary incontinence. And that just happens with a sudden, unexpected urge to urinate with an uncontrolled loss. So maybe this is a situation that you've experienced. You are driving into your car, you park in the garage, and you're getting out, and all of a sudden you just have to go. You can hardly get the door unlocked, you can hardly get to the bathroom and get your pants undone, and you just have this immediate urge to go. That's the urge urinary incontinence. And most of them, most people, have a mixed. It's just kind of a little bit of a combination of both. So let's start off, just like with any anatomy presentation or any um, medical presentation, we bring out the anatomy. So if we want to look at this, this is a side view. And so just to kind of orientate you, so here's your spine, you've got your bowel, your uterus, as this is a female, and your bladder. So with that, some of the things that we're gonna be talking about with that bladder are that as you're trying to go, right here is a little sphincter, and that's at the tip of the bladder that's just kind of holding it closed. And so as that is closing, then the bladder continues to fill with urine, and the pelvic floor muscles continue to contract. And then when the bladder decides to go, it contracts, this bar opens up, and the pelvic floor relaxes so that you can eliminate. We also talk a lot about with incontinence, we're not gonna have time to talk about it today, but we always ask a lot about your, your gynecological history and if you have any um, constipation issues. As you can see, the close proximity to all these organs, if you have problems with one, it can definitely impact another. 
Here's another look at her pelvic floor. So this is kind of like the bird's eye view looking down. To orientate you again, here's the pubic bone in front and your spine in the back. And then you have your urethra, the vaginal opening, and the rectum. So as we're looking down there, you can see that these pelvic muscles kind of sling around all of those openings to provide support. And then you have the deeper muscles back through here that also provide some support and stability. So you can kind of see that you, when you're contracting these muscles, you're gonna have kind of a squeeze and it's gonna close those openings and then kind of lift that urethra, vagina, and external anal sphincter up in towards your body. Towards the end, we'll, talk, we'll practice some of the exercises, but this is kind of something you can reflect on as far as knowing how the pelvic floor anatomy all works. So let's talk more about bladder control. There's always that question of how does this all really work? Well, we know that the blood filters and returns to the bloodstream about 200 quarts of fluid a day. And within that 200 quarts, we have two quarts that are kind of pulled off in the form of urine and they need to be removed from the body daily. So the rest of that, the rest of that fluid continues to circulate through our bodies. And so this is an interesting fact, that only 15 drops of urine per minute are stored in the bladder. So if you're a person that thinks that you need to completely go to the bathroom every 30 minutes because you drank a lot this morning, it's like it's really not, it does happen if you're a higher drinker, you're probably gonna have an increased frequency. But, the, but suddenly the kidneys can't all, um, just circulate and filter out all that urine so really our bodies can store and our bladders can store a lot more um, if we can retrain them. We start to get the first sensation to void at 150 milliliters to 200. So that's what is represented here, a very small amount. But our bladder can store up to 400 to 600 milliliters of urine. And this is 500 milliliters here. So you can see there's a large difference in that. So really, when you get that first sensation to void here, probably if you're drinking a lot in the morning, you can store a lot more. So I encourage you, don't go to the bathroom just in case all the time. So with the postponement avoiding, so what happens is the nerve signals to the bladder, um, actually goes up to this sacral micturition center, and it tells the bladder that um, it, it can't contract yet. It's still filling up. So this bladder is just filling up with more and more urine and it's providing a little bit of a stretch. And so then that's sending the signal up to the brain and the brain sends a signal right back down to it. It says you can't contract, you can't go yet. And so with that, it tells the bladder that it better, um, it better continue to contract right here at that trigone and so that it must continue to fill. Once, um, so the outlet pressure, so this pressure right here from the, from the pelvic floor muscles contracting is tighter than the pressure up here. So as the pelvic floor muscles are contracting, this must stay closed and continue to fill. Then with bladder emptying, those stretch receptors send that message up to the brain and the brain says, okay, you, you're pretty full here. It's starting to get uncomfortable. So then the brain cues you to start moving to the bathroom and hopefully you have enough control that you can, you can sit down, remove your clothes, sit down. And then once you're sitting on the toilet and remember you're sitting on the toilet, it's not good to be hovering over top of it because your pelvic floor muscles can't relax. So once you relax, then the sphincters at the top of the bladder relax and then the muscle contracts, that bladder's a muscle and it contracts and it empties out all of the urine. Well, all but about 30 to 100 milliliters in just one continuous stream. Sometimes as we age, we start to hold a little bit more like that, closer to 100. And so that might be something that your doctor tests to see if you're having recurrent infections that maybe you're just not completely emptying. Um, so that's something that does happen. So let's talk about some changes with aging. That's kind of the normal process. But some of the things that happen um, with, with aging is that upper urinary tract has a decreased ability of those kidney cells to filter blood and concentrate urine during the day. So that means 
during the night, you're going to be filtering a lot more. And that's why it is normal for people over 65 to have to go to the bathroom one to two times at night. Under 65, zero to one time is normal. There's also a delayed sense of that urge. Sometimes you're not getting that sensation of that occurs at like 150 milliliters. Sometimes you just don't really feel it until it gets a little bit more full. Changes in aging also occur with fluid intake. Many times when we start having bladder problems, we restrict our fluids. With that, where the thought process is that if I'm not drinking as much, I won't have to go to the bathroom as much. Unfortunately, it also is concentrating your urine a lot more, and sometimes that can cause problems because the bladder gets irritated and it just wants to get it out. There's also some changes that occur with the bladder is that these, um, the lining here can kind of have some muscle and it can kind of have just some random sporadic um, overactivity, little, little twitches or little spasms. And for the most part, we don't really even feel it. But with um, aging, we start having more of those occurrences. There's also a smaller amount that's actually voided. We kind of spoke about that earlier, that sometimes you start maintaining just a little bit more fluid um, within there, and then it eventually leads to a smaller bladder capacity. And last, but not, and then in men, you have a large prostate. So if this was the male picture, you would have a little bit of an enlargement here of that prostate gland that tends to get larger with age, and so then there's more restriction in that urethra. In women, they have more hormonal changes. So within that urethra, it has a thin mucosal tissue that kind of collapses on each other. So think of it like a straw, and it has some sticky material that kind of collapse, collapses in, in its uh, mucosal adaptation and secretes mucus to enhance that closure. But when you're lacking estrogen, it's like that just stays open. So it's just like an open straw. So that might be why you kind of leak and you didn't even know it was gonna happen. Um, however, those things are sensitive to hormone and some people will choose to do a little hormone replacement in speaking with their doctor. So talking about epidemiology, I'm just kind of reviewing some of this information so that you can realize that you're not alone if this is happening to you. So by looking at many different studies, older women, 34% have any urinary incontinence and 12% have daily urinary incontinence. In the middle age and younger population, it was 25%. So if you think about it, that's one in four people. So think about all of the women and the friends that you know. It kind of makes you think that, you, that at least one or two of you within a small group is probably having incontinence, but it's just not talked about. It is more common in, uh, to have stress incontinence in the younger women with the increase in activity and pressure. And then as we get older, it's more of kind of that urge and mixed incontinence. And who, for those males that might be watching, I also want to let you know that you might have lower incontinence on the, um, earlier in your life, but as you age, the incontinence rates for men significantly increase, especially after having a prostatectomy or other prostate um, related procedures. So some of the risk factors include possibly just pelvic floor weakness because you don't work the muscle, it's going to get weak. Prolapse or there's some tissue that's coming, falling into the vaginal canal. There might be nerve damage from surgery or birth trauma, sphincter damage, or maybe even some neurological disorders that are causing that. Medications can ha have a um, contributing effect along with the increase in age and whenever we have a decrease in cognitive function, impaired mobility, or an increase in, in weight. So the thing is, is that the populations have definitely increased, and they predicted a significant increase in these conditions, just with our aging population. So you can see how, how um, prevalent these conditions are, and that's just urinary incontinence, fecal incontinence, and the pelvic organ prolapse. So that is an increase from 28 million to 43 million people per day that are, that are impacted by incontinence. So no wonder that we're pretty busy in the clinic helping a lot of people out. 
So let's talk about normal bladder patterns. This is kind of interesting information that you should urinate every three to four hours or about five to eight times a day. The average time interval is between two to five hours. So the younger population can hold it for three to four hours. And um, in the older population, we try to get them to go at least every two hours, kind of on a timed voiding because if they're not getting that first little message or that first sensation that they have to go, then suddenly they have a full bladder and they sneeze or they have to run to the bathroom and they can't control it, then they have the accident. So if we go on a more frequent basis, usually that can also control it. Uh, talking about hydration, urine should be light yellow and the urine stream, if you should count it, should last 10 to 15 seconds. The total number of nighttime voids, I kind of went over earlier. And the amount of voiding is usually the first one in the morning is the longest of eight to 12 ounces. And then common daily void throughout the day is six to 10. But there's also some impacts of hydration and the food. I had mentioned that some of the different, um, the bladders do not like to be having concentrated urine in it, and that can be a, a bladder a irritant actually make you want to go more. However, if you drink over 100 ounces of fluid, it might be associated with an increase in continence because you just can't handle that much fluid. There's some food in irritants for our bladder also, and in the always category are caffeine, alcohol, coffee, regardless if it is decaf or not, the tannins in it make it an irritant, chocolate and smoking. And on an individual basis, sometimes people are more irritated by citrus, tomato, artificial sweeteners, and carbonation of any kind, even if it's carbonated water, spicy food, milk, and sugar. Now those are, are like I said, sometimes it does not, does not bother everybody. Um, the other thing is we want to make sure you eat plenty of natural fiber because constipation causes straining on those pelvic floor muscles and if we have constipation, it's definitely going to impact and push on the bladder and cause us problems that way too. So it's time to kind of start thinking about these pelvic floor exercises. Hopefully you have an idea of what your normal pattern of bladder habits are, and maybe we should start working on some exercises to continue to strengthen it. If you don't have any problems, that's awesome. We want you to continue to be healthy and well. And so I would also encourage you to start thinking about doing some of these kegels on a regular basis. So first to start thinking about visualizing those muscles. It's kind of a hammock from front to back. And you can kind of think about squeezing around that urethra, maybe squeezing a little bit at the anus and lifting it up and towards your body. If you're sitting, you might want to sit up nice and tall. Sometimes we'll even kind of say like you're going to sit right on that perineum or sitting up nice and tall so you're sitting right on your vagina. And then if you contract, you can kind of feel it lift up and away from the, the mat or the chair. And if you cough, you might even feel that perineum kind of touching and kind of pushing down into the chair. It's okay to look at your body and maybe you need to see those muscles in order to get a better idea of feeling them contract. And then I want to encourage you to always contract with using that diaphragmatic breath. So you're going to contract as you exhale, and that's gonna facilitate a deeper contraction from your abdominals, your diaphragm, and the pelvic floor. So we're gonna take this into a few exercises. These are called Kegel exercises. So once again, it's kind of a squeeze and lift of the pelvic floor. There should be no movement of the stomach or buttocks. And you're gonna to try to perform 30 to 80 of those contractions a day. Not all at one time, but more kind of throughout the day, you're gonna to try to incorporate that. But really do quality contraction. So think about those muscles and try to really feel what, what those muscles are doing and contracting. You also wanna do quick contractions. Just like when you cough or sneeze, that muscle needs to quickly contract and give you support. But then you also need to do longer contractions like holding it for, for up to 10 seconds if you can hold it that long. You might need to start at three to five seconds and then progress as you get stronger. That's just to kind of build up the general everyday strength of those muscles because they're working all day for you. Another reminder is to completely relax between the contractions. We don't want to contribute to some other problems that might be caused from high tone 
And that's a whole other little um, education session is to talk about if we have too much tone we have and we have constipation, pelvic pain, pain with uh, sexual dysfunction, those types of things. So definitely contract and squeeze up as high as you can and relax and let it go all the way down to relaxed state. A couple other thoughts that you can think about is you're going to squeeze your pelvic floor before you sneeze. Kind of give it a little support before you have that intra-abdominal pressure pushing down and uh, giving yourself um, a chance to hold that. And if you're doing a lot of lifting, like maybe your groceries, your laundry bag, or your children, think about exhaling and contracting your pelvic floor abdominals before you lift, or even before a sit to stand, you can start incorporating that activity into your daily, daily functional tasks. So here's a few other exercises that you could try on your own. You could be doing kegels in bed, sitting, standing, any position where you'd want to um, continue to strengthen that muscle. We definitely have to focus on that isolated muscle if that's what we want to strengthen. Just like we wouldn't do a bicep curl in order to strengthen our pelvic floor, you need to think about it and to try to activate the right muscle. Now, the, the one problem with doing the presentation and not really having you here to show you how to do these is that that we know through research that half the people that are just told to do exercises just like I'm doing here don't have a clue how to do them and they're trying and they're being unsuccessful so if you're trying these exercises at home for a couple of weeks and not having any changes then make sure you go see a physical therapist to teach you how to do these correctly and a pelvic physical therapist one is specializes and has advanced training in doing the evaluation um, for this so you're going to also maybe do a kegel while you're seated and, and with coughing. So just seated, you're going to contract those muscles and then do a little cough and try to hold that. You might do a bridge and incorporate that pelvic floor control as you're bridging up. Or maybe it's a standard plank just start against the countertop and you're squeezing your legs tight, pulling your belly button in and squeezing the pelvic floor at the same time. And again, we talked about that transition from sit to stand with including that pelvic floor. So just to motivate you a small, about a, a little bit more, would be to talk about the cost of treatment for incontinence. And these are almost um, 20 years old, but the annual direct cost for women was $12.4 billion, and that's talking about 70% of the cost was from absorbent products, like your poise and your Depends. 14% of nursing home admissions, because if people are incontinent at home, the families just can't take care of them when they start becoming incontinent of bowel and bladder. And then 9% from treatment. With, within that treatment cost, a lot of it is just from surgery. And then some people have complications and then just the, the cost of the diagnostic and evaluations. So you can see actually coming to physical therapy, even if it's for four to six visits, is gonna be a very minimal cost in comparison to having a lifetime of absorbent products. So the annual direct cost per individual typically with incontinence is $250 to $900. Basically it depends upon how many absorbent products you're using per day. And then you have to think about the indirect cost of missed work productivity, especially if you have dysfunctional voiding patterns and you're going to the bathroom real frequently. It's a lot of miss, missed uh, time away from your desk. We also want to talk about that sequela of urinary incontinence. Many people stay home more frequently and they decrease their social activities. They have decreased physical activity because they don't want to leak during that. Um, it leads to deconditioning and an increase in falls as people are rushing to the bathroom um, and increased depression. I will have to say that I would rather have you stay active, socially engage, and, and do your physical activities and sometimes we just have to use the old um, saying of you have to pad up and play on. Um, but we can continue to work on becoming more continent and, and uh, still keeping you active. So that concludes the presentation. If you have any uh, questions, you can sure reach me in the clinic or um, that's my email. If you have direct questions, I'd be glad to an answer them. And I hope that you have uh, learned a little bit more about the normal bladder control and I hope that you continue to stay healthy and well and stay safe.
Des Moines University Clinic Physical Therapy, our providers are experts in movement and improving your overall health and function. We pride ourselves in focusing on the whole person and develop rehabilitation programs that address the psychological, social, and physical aspects of your pain and functional impairment. Our state-of-the-art facility includes private treatment rooms for your privacy and comfort. The technology utilized by the expert clinicians facilitate the outcomes of the rehabilitation program. We provide general orthopedic rehabilitation following surgery or injury along with the treatment of aches and pains that occur from aging or living an active lifestyle. We have therapists that have advanced training and specialty clinics for vestibular, balance, and concussion recovery. We also treat many neurological conditions, like the recovery from a stroke or Parkinson's disease. We have specialty training in the management of persistent pain conditions and strive to improve the quality of life and to keep you moving. Another specialty clinic is working with men, women, and children that have pelvic floor problems with incontinence or leakage of bowel and bladder, constipation, pelvic pain, perinatal care, or the recovery from cancer or pelvic surgery. Although many individuals may not need rehabilitation, they can benefit from a wellness assessment to help improve movement that will reduce the risk of injury and improve general wellness. The physical therapy wellness exam is designed for all ages as an assessment of an individual's flexibility, strength, walking, balance, and aerobic conditioning. The experts that care for you at Des Moines University Clinic are more than just clinicians. They're researchers, teachers, and mentors who are training tomorrow's healthcare professionals. Call today or visit dmu.edu slash clinic.
Hello, my name is Dr. Kathy Fresh, and I work at Des Moines University as an associate professor in the College of Podiatric Medicine and Surgery. There I teach students as well as treat patients. Um, over the years, my clinical practice has more gone on the way of wound care and taking care of people with chronic wounds and wound care management. So I'd like to talk to you about the different types of wounds that can happen as you get older and how you can take care of it and when to go to the doctor. So throughout this presentation, I will be using the words ulcer and wounds interchangeably. So what is an ulcer? Basically, it's just an open sore that's caused by a break in the skin that doesn't heal within the one to two week time period that you would expect it to heal in. And just FYI, I have a lot of pictures in here that um, show different wounds. And so if you are sensitive to that, you may not want to look at all of the different things. But um, next, I'm going to talk about the different ulcer types. There's a lot of different things that can cause wounds and keep them from healing. And sometimes people can have more than one thing going on at a time, making things a little bit more complex. So we'll talk about arterial, venous, traumatic, neuropathic, and pressure ulcer. So I like to kind of talk about the difference between veins versus arteries because people sometimes don't always understand the difference. Veins carry blood back to the heart. They must go up against gravity. They have a little bit of a thinner vessel wall. And because they're going up against gravity, um, they have valves that are present. So that way the blood doesn't flow back down hill, so to speak. Sometimes over time, those valves can get damaged, and so the blood leaks back down, causing a lot of swelling within the leg. Then the fluid and the blood leaks out, causing damage to the skin, which can lead to wounds. Um, also, you know, if patients can't walk as well um, due to mobility issues, this can cause some swelling issues as well because you need your muscles to help with the veins with this. Arteries. Um, are what carry the blood from the heart and lungs down to your foot, and so it carries oxygenated blood. You have thicker vessel wall, no valves. And so if you have a blockage in the artery, you're not getting enough oxygen to the foot or leg. And so this can lead to wound healing problems versus with the veins. Usually they don't have blockages, but the veins don't work properly to where all the fluid goes against gravity and you cause more swelling. So this is kind of just showing how the calf pump helps. So when you're walking around or moving your muscles, the muscle squeeze those veins and then will help to get the blood moving in the right direction. Let's take a look at the arterial ulcers. They are very characteristic. Typically they will either be black or yellow. They won't have a nice pink healthy base. And this is due to lack of oxygen. As long as you still have good feeling in your feet, these wounds have a tendency to be very painful. Um, and with people who have severe blockages within their arteries, they seem to be more painful when the leg is elevated. And so that's a big key that you might have an arterial issue. If you're getting a wound that's looking at like this, then you definitely want to go to your doctor and see if you can get tested to make sure you're getting enough blood flow to the foot because there are procedures that can be done to open it up. These type of ulcers have higher risk of further wound complications and sometimes can lead to amputation. The treatment, biggest thing, vascular testing to where they can do some basic tests to see if you're getting circulation. You may need to have an angiogram where they make a little small incision up into the groin and inject dye to look at the arteries. Then the vascular surgeons can see where there is blockage. And if there's a blockage, they can put a stench like they would do for your heart um, or a balloon to open things up. If you have a wound like this, Usually I want to try to keep it as dry as possible just because the body doesn't have enough circulation to heal it and the tissue essentially is dying off. And so we want to keep it dry so that way it doesn't get too moist because if it gets too moist, then bacteria can get in and that can make you sick and lead to further amputation. So usually I recommend betadine and trying to keep these wounds dry and not soaking the, the foot. Another product that I use a lot is something called Iodazor, which is an iodine gel. Um, kind of good for those yellow wounds to help maintain a moisture balance. Um, and you can find that on Amazon for about $20 to $40 a tube.
Venus ulcers um, are usually in a different location and have a different appearance. They're generally up around the ankle or the calf. And again, this is because the valves aren't working. You're getting a lot of extra swelling within the legs. You may see varicose veins with these. These also can be painful as well, but usually not quite as painful as the arterial ulcer. Also, you might start to see brown staining of your skin, and that's just because the red blood cells are leaking out and breaking open, causing staining to occur. The biggest thing with this, because you are getting that extra swelling and the veins aren't working properly, compression is key, and you need to have compression all the way from the toes all the way up to the knee. And this is a big question I get from people, particularly if they have a smaller wound caused by you know, the varicose veins and venous stasis ulcers. Um, why, if I have a small wound, do I have to wrap the whole leg? And it has to do with just getting all the fluid up and going back up into um, your body and going out through your kidneys and urinating it out versus it hanging out in your leg and linking out these wounds because the fluid is going to want to go out the path of least resistance and compression has been shown to be the number one way to get it to heal. Also, just elevating your legs can help to get the swelling down. Sometimes you may need to see your primary care doctor and have an increase in your diuretics um, or your water pills. Um, and sometimes we'll send the, you, know, you to see a vascular surgeon to where they can do some th things with the veins as well to kind of redirect the flow. Um, once things healed, then usually we like to keep you in long-term compression, um, just so that way we don't get a whole bunch of extra fluid down on the legs because then the skin can break back open, blister, and that fluid will want to come out. And so either with compression socks, which I know are hard to get on and off for a lot of people, particularly as they're aged due to hand strength or lack of mobility. So sometimes I'll use products such as edema wear, which is the bottom one, or tuba grip or surgery grip, which is the top one. Um, the edema wear is kind of like a heavy duty fishnet stocking. It's a little easier to get on and off than the compression socks, or you can get the tuba grip um, as a big roll and you can just cut it off from the roll and those are usually pretty easy to get on and you know, off. You can also use A-straps as well. But again, you want to kind of go all the way from the toes to the knees so you have nice even compression and it's not digging into the leg. Sometimes you can get ulcers due to trauma and it can just be minor trauma, particularly because skin gets a little bit thinner as people age and sometimes with certain medications such as steroids can cause um, skin to thin. Also, a lot of people who are older are on blood thinners, and so even a minor trauma can cause some bleeding underneath the skin and cause um, a hematoma. As you see in this picture here, the patient originally had a little bit of a skin tear and the hematoma, it was stitched, and then that skin all dies just from having all that um, extra blood sitting underneath the skin, and so you end up with a sore. Other things that might contribute if you have heart, lung, liver, kidney disease, so you have a lot of extra fluid um, just because your body isn't processing it well and all that fluid ends up in the legs. So again, compression will help to, with healing on these types of wounds. Neuropathic is generally due to diabetes where people have lost sensation in their feet, but not always. Sometimes just with age, people can start to lose feeling in their feet or if they've had um, problems with back issues where they have bulging discs or stenosis can cause neuropathy within the feet. Um, usually with these, these are going to be on the bottom of the foot where people might be getting high pressure areas and callusing. And when you lose sensation in your feet, the calluses start to build up and build up and to build up and you don't change the way you walk because you don't feel it. And eventually the callus will thicken up so much that the tissue underneath breaks down and then you end up with a sore. Um, biggest places I see it are underneath the big toe joint um, where you see like on the toe itself and then underneath the ball of the foot on the um, outside part of the foot. Sometimes you'll see staining of the callus like you see in this picture here where you're getting micro bleeding within um, that callus tissue and it's not painful because um, the person has lost sensation in their feet. Um, and a lot of it can be due to foot deformities that happen over time where, you know, again, you just have these high pressure areas, maybe due to curling of the toes or a hammer toe, the callus builds up and then the skin breaks down, like you can see in this picture. Other foot deformities, bunion, as you can see on the left, um, you know, the one from the second from the left, they're walking more on the outside of the foot. You know, again, hammer toes can push the toes down or you might have a flat foot. 
So the biggest thing is just trying to get pressure relief, trying not to go barefoot or soft foot, wearing good supportive shoes or sandals, um, debridement, which is, that just means coming into the clinic and not doing it yourself. We don't want people doing their own bathroom surgery, um, where we trim down all that extra callus because it helps to relieve some of that pressure. Sometimes we might put you in a caster shoe for a while. And then if you're diabetic, trying to keep your blood sugars under good control. Um, and then the final ulcer category is pressure ulcers. And this is usually due to people who are wheelchair bound or been hospitalized recently or were in bed for a while. The biggest place where I see it is on the back of the heel, particularly if they've been lying in bed and not moving. And so heel protector boot, like you can see up the top, is very helpful. Sometimes you can see them on the front of the ankle, as you can see there, where people were getting wrapped and the wraps got a little bit too tight. Um, other reasons why we might see ulcers um, due to pressure is if people are sitting in their wheelchair, they have hard wheelchair rests, and their foot is just sitting in one position all day long, and that can cause increased pressure. The biggest thing, again, is just pressure relief, um, sometimes using pillows or other padding while uh, the patient um, is laying in bed or sitting in the recliner, so that way they're not having that pressure on the one spot all day long. And who is at risk? Kind of what we've already talked about. Other things I'd like to kind of point out is that people who smoke um, or use nicotine products. Nicotine causes constriction of your arteries, um, so that way you're not getting as much blood flow and also reduces the oxygen to the feet, and so has been shown to cause wound healing. Um, we already kind of talked about the other things such as neuropathy, diabetes, varicose vein swelling, but diet can play a big issue too just because um, you need a lot of extra protein to help heal wounds once you get them. Um, diabetes blood glucose goals, want to keep your blood sugar between 100 and 120 if you can. Anything higher than that can lead to wound healing problems. It's been shown that the hemoglobin A1C, the long-term marker, um, for every 1% increase above 7%, wound healing decreases dramatically. And so if your blood sugars are running that high, then it can lead to neuropathy or numbness within the feet. Um, it can lead to arterial disease where you have blockages and lead to those arterial ulcers. And this is just showing the study where they had shown that um, wound healing rates really decrease once you get above 7% with your hemoglobin A1C. So nutrition plays a big part. Um, recently, there was recommendations from the council that looks at pressure ulcers, but it can, it can apply to all ulcers. They recommended that you need to have 1.2 to 1.5 grams per kilogram of body weight. So for those of us who are um, not as keen with the met metric system, um, that is 0.6 to 0.68 grams per body weight. And so what that translates out to is a 150 pound person needs about 82 to 102 grams, a 200 person needs 108 to 135 grams. Um, some good protein choices are lean beef, chicken, fish, um, you can use dairy, uh, nuts, um, beans, those sort of things can all help. Um, or I encourage people to do protein shakes like Ensure or Boost or Juven is one specifically for wound healing. It's a little bit expensive, but it's nice because you can mix it into water and they do have a flavorless version that you can mix it into whatever drink that you have. So recommendations, make sure you check your feet daily if you are at risk. Um, all diabetics should have a yearly foot exam. Um, those who are at risk examine one to six months by podiatrist or by your primary care physician. And kind of be aware, you know, just because you have a wound that doesn't hurt, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's a big thing. That might be, you know, or, you know that might not mean that it's uh, a good thing. Um, that can mean that you have lost sensation in your feet, and if you have a wound for a long time and it doesn't hurt, then you probably need to be uh, seen by somebody. Um, shoe gear, you need to make sure that something that's easy to get on and off and it's nice and stable, um, lightweight ideally, and make sure you have plenty of toe room. You don't want the toes squished together. And just because you were a size 7 when you're 20 years old doesn't mean that you still wear a size 7 when you're 60. As we age, the ligaments um, start to loosen, and that leads to a larger shoe size. And so you may need to be refitted um, as you grow older. And I know my, my you know, I myself has gone up a, um, a shoe size after I had my daughter. Um, if you are diabetic and you have peripheral neuropathy or arterial disease, 
Medicare will pay for um, one pair of shoes per year. Kind of do's and don'ts. If you're at risk, check your feet daily. Don't use heating pads on your feet or legs just because I've seen people who've ended up with burns, um, particularly people who are neuropathic. Make sure you check your water temperature. Um, I've seen a lot of people who've gone to soak their feet and had the um, water too hot and end up with bad burns and led to amputations. Don't go barefoot or soft footed around the house, particularly having neuropathy or arterial disease um, because you don't know what you could step on that could cause problems. So at least wear slippers or sandals. Um, use lotion on your dry skin so they don't crack open causing problems, but don't use in between the toes because it can get too moist in those areas and you need to make sure you dry very well in between the toes due to that um, because that can lead to sores. Don't use medicated corn removers if you're starting to get corns or calluses on the toes. Um, those corn removers contain acid and sometimes it can eat away your good skin leading to sores. Make sure you inspect your shoes before putting them on. Sometimes things can drop into your shoes. Um, I did have a patient many years ago who accidentally had a set of keys dropped into his shoes. He didn't realize it, walked around all day with keys in his shoes because his neuropathy was that bad and ended up with sores on his toes. Um, don't do your own bathroom surgery. Don't trim your own calluses. Um, you can use a nail file or a pumice stone on it, but don't take anything sharp to it. Make sure you elevate your legs when sitting, particularly if you're getting swelling. Um, that will help with your skin overall. And then I kind of put soaking feet, question mark. Um, again, you can soak your feet, but make sure you check the water temperature. If you're using Epsom salt, it might feel nice. However, sometimes that can have a drying effect if you already have dry skin. Caring for wounds at home. So you can clean with just saline or soap and water daily. Um, and it's okay to go ahead and get them wet and get them washed up. You don't need to use peroxide. Peroxide um, kills everything. It kills bacteria, but also kills the cells that are trying to form. And so I don't recommend just dumping a bunch of peroxide on your wounds due to that reason. Um, keep wounds covered with dry gauze or Band-Aid. Um, if it, the skin is thin or sensitive, use paper tape and gauze instead of the Band-Aid so that way you don't tear your skin. And the biggest thing that I also counsel people on is that wounds don't need air to heal, particularly on the lower extremity on the feet and legs. Um, just because we're walking around, a lot of people end up getting pet hair in them, dirt, debris that lead to infection. Also, if you have a lot of swelling within the legs, the legs start to um, have a lot of extra fluid coming out of them. They need to be covered and have compression on there to get the fluid up and out through the kidneys and not through the legs. And so we do want to keep wounds covered. Um, if swelling, definitely use your compression from toes to knee. Topically, I do recommend if, you know, from the store either bacitracin or polysporin. You can use triple antibiotic ointment or neosporin. However, sometimes people can develop a sensitivity to the third antibiotic um, in that particular ointment. So usually I recommend the bacitracin or the polysporin instead. Um, betadine is nice if you have a wound that you want to keep dry like an arterial ulcer um, or if you have a highly draining wound it will dry things out for you. Online you can purchase medical grade honey the brand name is MediHoney or the IO Desorb that I uh, mentioned earlier. Um, medical grade honey is a little bit different than your regular honey in that it is irradiated to kill any clostridial spores and it's a little bit thicker and honey has been shown to help with wound healing by decreasing bacteria and um, helping just with wound healing overall. When should you see a doctor if the wound really hasn't shown signs of healing after two to four weeks? If you have any signs of infection, um, pain when you don't normally have pain, redness, um, odor, blood glucose is really hard to control, and then of course fever, chills, nausea, or vomiting, or if the wound turns purple or black, that is a big sign that you need to get seen right away um, because you might have decreased circulation and you're at risk of losing a toe or a limb. So I hope you enjoyed my presentation and I'll welcome any questions that you guys have. Welcome to the Dermatology Club's presentation for the 50 and Better Fair 2020. While we are sad that we are unable to provide our typical skin exams, we are hoping to offer some good information about aging skin that may answer some of your questions or prompt you to schedule a visit with your provider. 
we are going to discuss common lesions that we can see with aging skin, both benign and malignant. Just a disclaimer, this is meant to be an informative presentation, but it is not meant to override any medical advice that you receive from your provider. If you are concerned about something, we encourage you to schedule a visit with your doctor. Our first common lesions are seborrheic keratoses, often called SKs. These are simply benign thickenings of the skin. They are a common sign of aging and can look very worrisome as they are often irregular in shape and color, but rest assured that these are entirely benign. They can range in color from tan to black, have a round to oval shape, and tend to be waxy or warty feeling to the touch. They appear stuck on and are often lovingly referred to as barnacles. Again, these are completely harmless and no treatment is necessary, although if you are concerned or bothered by these, consult your provider to discuss possible treatment options. Our next lesions are also benign and are called cherry angiomas. They get their name from the bright red cherry color that they possess. They are non-cancerous growths made of blood vessels that are commonly show up after the age of 30. Once they appear, they typically stick around and will not go away on their own, but again, they are not worrisome. They are generally quite small, about the size of a pinhead. Most people will see these on their trunk, so chest, abdomen, and back, but they can occur anywhere, so it's not abnormal to see these on your arms and legs. Our last truly benign lesions are moles. Many of you are probably familiar with moles and may have a few or several. Moles can be macules, which are flat or flush against the skin, or papules, which are slightly raised. As you can see, moles can range in color from tan to dark brown. Moles should be monitored, and we can do this by looking at the A, B, C, D, and E's. A is for asymmetry, and think about hypothetically cutting your mole in half, and is it the same on each side? If so, that's good. B stands for borders. We want to look at our border. We want our borders to be regular, not jagged. C is for color. The color should be uniform throughout. We don't want any speckling or spotting in our moles. D stands for diameter. And generally, moles should be less than six millimeters in diameter, although there are exceptions to this rule. And E is for evolution. Has your mole changed at all and how so? So we just want to monitor our moles from the first time that we see them and how they have changed throughout their lifetime. So why do we need to monitor our moles or watch for these changes? Although rare, moles have the potential to develop into melanoma. This is dangerous because melanoma has the potential to spread to other organs if not treated early. Here we can see some examples of normal moles compared to melanoma. So 20 to 30% of melanomas are found in existing moles, which is why it's important to really monitor those A, B, C, D, and E's of our moles. Our next lesions are called actinic keratoses, often shortened to AKs. They are described as rough, scaly spots that just never really go away. They are often found on frequently sun-exposed areas, so face, lips, ears, back of hands. They are considered pre-malignant because if they are left untreated, a small percentage may progress to squamous cell carcinoma. Finally, we'll talk about the most common types of cancer we can see on the skin. Basal cell carcinoma is the most common type of skin cancer. It can present very differently. It can be a non-healing lesion as seen in the picture on the bottom left, a shiny papule which is represented by the picture in the middle, or simply just a red patch. This is a very slow growing cancer and most are curable with minimal damage if treated early. Squamous cell carcinoma is the second most common cancer seen on the skin. This is what an actinic keratosis, which we talked about previously, has the potential of turning into if it is left untreated. This type of cancer can also be treated easily if caught early, but it has the potential to become invasive if left untreated, so it's highly recommended to have these treated. It may be hard to see in these pictures, but squamous cell carcinomas can typically have an overlying crust with raised edges and a central depression. They can also bleed on occasion. This concludes our presentation, and we appreciate you taking the time to watch it. We are disappointed that we were unable to see you all in person this year, but we hope that you are staying safe and healthy during these unprecedented times. Again, this presentation was meant to be informative only. If you have concerns about anything on your skin, please seek the advice of your healthcare provider.
Hello and welcome to this year's 50 and Better Health Fair. My name is Michaela Shia. And I'm Joseph Thompson. And we are second year physician assistant students at Des Moines University. Thank you very much for joining us for this presentation on blood thinners. Today's first question is why take a blood thinner? Most often, blood thinners are prescribed to prevent blood clots, which can become lodged in blood vessels in the brain, which is called a stroke, or the lungs, the legs, or other locations, which can all be equally dangerous. Blood thinners don't actually thin your blood, though. The medical word for blood thinner is actually anticoagulant, which means against clotting. These medications work by preventing clots from forming. The next topic we're going to be discussing is blood thinner uses. While there are many reasons a blood thinner may be beneficial for your health, the three most common indications for starting a blood thinner are one, for prevention of a stroke, which is a clot to the brain, two, prevention or treatment of a venous thromboembolism, which is a clot from the veins, or three, prevention of an arterial thromboembolism, which is a clot from the arteries. Of all of these treatment uses of blood thinners, there are two categories of blood thinner uses, primary and secondary prevention. Primary prevention is the use of blood thinners that are taken to hinder the development of a patient's first clot. Secondary prevention are the use of blood thinners taken to hinder the development of a second clot. Building off of the last slide, now we are going to discuss who needs blood thinners. There are many different reasons why your provider may want you to take a blood thinner. Some of these reasons include disease processes, primary preventions, or secondary preventions. Of possible reasons to take blood thinners for disease processes, Indications include inherited or genetic blood disorders, examples being factor V Leiden, protein S or C deficiencies, or antiphospholipid syndrome, and many more. Disease processes also, like cancers um, or receiving chemo and radiation for cancer, in also increase your risk of clots, which may be another reason why your provider may want you taking blood thinners. For primary preventions, Heart conditions are often a common reason for starting blood thinner use, of those being atrial fibrillation, heart failure, mechanical heart valves or valves, and coronary artery disease. Other reasons for primary prevention include prolonged hospital stay following surgeries or long-term admission to hospitals or long-term care facilities. Lastly, primary prevention options may be for mobility issues. Limited walking increases the risk of developing a deep vein clot. Lastly, for secondary preventions, personal history of a clot, such as heart attack, stroke, stroke, or deep vein thrombosis, also increases your risk of developing another clot. History of clot embolism is also an, an additional reason why your provider may want you taking a blood thinner. Because there are both risks and benefits of being on a blood thinner, your provider will want to know about your past medical history to determine whether a blood thinner is right for you. Thankfully, there are evidence-based guidelines like the CHADS VASC score, which help your provider calculate your risks and benefits. They'll want to know if you've had congestive heart failure, hypertension, if you're over the age of 75, or any of these other listed items. One of the most common blood thinners used today is warfarin, or Coumadin, for clot prevention. For those taking Coumadin, frequent office visits to measure your INR may be second nature to you by now. But what does your INR actually mean? INR stands for International Normalized Ratio. It's used as a measure to see your range of clotting time based on the dosage of the warfarin that you are currently taking. An INR value lower than two increases your risk of clotting, while an INR value over three in increases your risk of bleeding. 
As discussed previously, the use of blood thinners can be for primary or secondary prevention. Knowing how to use these blood thinners really does make a difference for your health. So knowing the statistics is something that is really important. For primary prevention, on average, the CDC reports one American dying from a clot every six minutes. And of those suffering from blood clots, the three most common risks have been associated with cancer, hospitalizations, and pregnancy. For secondary prevention, three out of 10 people who have had a clot will suffer a second clot within 10 years of the first. Patients with cancer have a 3.6 times higher risk for developing recurrent blood clots as well. We've already talked a little bit about warfarin, but there are several other types of blood thinners on the market. The newest kind are called direct oral anticoagulants. Additionally, there are some medications used in hospitals by doctors like after surgery. Warfarin is the least expensive, but it does require frequent blood tests, which can be inconvenient. Warfarin is also affected by the amount of vitamin K you eat. It's not that you can't eat vitamin K containing foods, it's just that you have to eat a stable amount. Common foods that have vitamin, high levels of vitamin K include green leafy vegetables and cruciferous vegetables like Brussels sprouts, broccoli, and cauliflower. Direct oral anticoagulants are another kind of blood thinner, most commonly Eliquis or Apixaban, which did recently become generic, so we have hope that it will come down in price soon. One important food interaction that you should be aware of is that grapefruit juice can increase the amount of Apixaban in your blood, which may cause increased bleeding, so be cautious about drinking too much grapefruit juice. While on a blood thinner, it's important to tell your doctor what other medications you're taking. Just because a med is over the counter does not mean that it is totally safe. Some meds that are commonly taken that can interfere with blood thinners include the NSAID category. This includes ibuprofen, also known as Advil or Motrin, naproxen, also known as Aleve, Anaprox, Midol, and Walproxen, and aspirin. Herbs that can interfere with blood thinners include alfalfa, anise, and bilberry. We've already discussed the main benefits of taking a blood thinner, which is to prevent clots from forming. However, the flip side of that is the risks. The main risk of taking a blood thinner is serious bleeding. There is always some serious risk of bleeding, especially if you have a major injury, need surgery, or have an epidural, which is inserting a needle into your spine for anesthesia. Studies have been done which evaluate the risks and benefits, and your provider will help you analyze these risks and benefits and decide if a blood thinner is right for you. This slide covers the most important things that you can do as a patient to manage your blood thinner. First of all, take your medication at the same time every day. I would recommend setting a timer for yourself. If you forget a dose, take it as soon as you remember. But if it's very close to the time for your next dose, just go ahead and skip the dose you missed and take the next one on time. Do not take two doses at the same time as this can increase your risk for bleeding. Do not stop taking your blood thinner unless a doctor tells you to, as this will increase your risk of strokes and clots. Do not run out of your medication. Make sure you get your refills before you need them. If you fall and hit your head, or injure yourself in some other manner, call your doctor even if you feel okay as he may want to assess the risk for bleeding. Finally, to prevent small nicks and cuts, use a soft toothbrush and an electric razor. Finally, I just wanted to share GoodRx.com with all of you. GoodRx is a free website where you can find coupons and competitive pricing for the medications that you're taking to find them at the least expensive price. Thank you so much for joining Joe and I for this lesson on blood thinners. We hope that you learned something today and are able to manage your blood thinner appropriately.
Hello, my name is Josh Modric, and I am a second year DO student with the DMU Oncology Club. And I'd like to take a few minutes today to talk to you about screening for cancer and why it's important for you. So what we want to talk about today are some of the more common cancers for the 50 or better age group and what the current recommendations for who should be tested and why. And uh, these are breast cancer, colon cancer, and prostate cancer. So what is screening and why is it important? These are tests that we do before you feel sick in order to catch diseases in an early state. This is important because many cancers can be noticed before they have the possibility to spread, which makes them easier to treat and more likely to be cured. And this plays an active role in improving your quality of life and peace of mind. So first we'll talk about screening for breast cancer. The United States Preventative Services Task Force recommends women ages 50 to 74 should get a mammogram every other year. After 75, the benefit to screening becomes less clear, and this is something you should discuss with your health care providers to decide if you want to continue screening. Symptoms of breast cancer to watch out for would be uh, new lumps in the breast or armpit, uh, increased density of the breast tissue, or dimpling of the skin, which is usually described as having the same texture as an orange peel. There are several methods that can be used to find breast cancers, and these include mammograms, MRIs, thermograms, and physical exams performed by a doctor. In the past, the self-breast exam used to be recommended for routine use, but this hasn't been shown to be beneficial. When a suspicious lump is found, then a tissue sample will be taken in order to determine what it is. Looking at the five-year survival rates, we can really see the benefit of detecting breast cancers early. Uh, when the tumor is found in the earliest stage, there's a 99% chance of it being cured after five years. And even once there's some spread to regional lymph nodes, there's still an 86% survival rate thanks to new treatment options. But this drops down to 27% once it has spread to other parts of the body. So it's really important that we find these as quickly as possible. Next, we'll talk about colon cancer. The current recommendations are that everyone aged 50 to 75 should be screened for colon cancer. Some people may need to start earlier depending on their family history or other conditions. After 75 is when you should talk to your doctor about whether more testing will be beneficial for you. And the symptoms to look out for are unintentional weight loss, changes in your bowel habits, and blood in the stool. This can be either red or black. And also keep in mind that if you have bleeding after wiping, this could be instead a sign of hemorrhoids. There are many different ways to test for colon cancer, including colonoscopy, sigmoidoscopy, CT scans, testing for blood in the stool, the barium enemas, and DNA tests of the stool, which you may have seen advertisements for. They can be done at home and sent into a lab. But I really want to emphasize that the gold standard for colon cancer screening is the colonoscopy. Yes, nobody likes getting these done, but it's very beneficial because not only can it find cancers early, but it can also find polyps, which are growths that are not cancer, but they could become cancer if they continue to grow. And these polyps can be removed during the colonoscopy without needing any other procedures or treatments. So it's really a two for one in both detecting and preventing cancer. Uh, colonoscopy sh should be done every 10 years or every five years if you have a higher risk. And if you've never had one before, then you're most likely to benefit. And here again, you can see the benefit of screening in the survival rates, going from 90% survival when detected early down to 71 and then down to just 14% if the cancer has spread before diagnosis. And then the last topic we'll talk about today is screening for prostate cancer. This screening is not generally recommended for everyone. Men should have a discussion with their doctor about the risks and benefits, and then make a decision about if and how often they want to be checked for prostate cancer. The symptoms that you should be looking out for at home would be difficulty urinating, frequent urination, blood in the urine, or new erectile dysfunction. The methods used for screening for prostate cancer include the digital rectal exam 
and testing for prostate specific antigen in the blood. There are some issues with these tests, which is why they're not recommended for everyone. There are false positives. These tests can find conditions that are benign and not actually cancerous. And then another issue is overdiagnosis and overtreatment. Uh, many prostate cancers grow at a very slow rate and they might never actually cause any problems. Sometimes it can be difficult to tell whether a particular tumor is gonna cause problems or not. So if we find these tumors and treat them, we might actually be doing more harm than good. And you can see this reflected in the survival rates where almost everyone with early stage prostate cancer will make it to five years. And it's only the later stages of the disease that start to affect survival and the quality of life. And our last point to take away is uh, over 50% of cancers can be prevented. There's several factors that are involved in causing cancers that can be controlled by eating a proper diet. Uh, you want to reduce alcohol intake, consume less processed meats, and eat lots of fiber. Uh, regular exercise can help prevent cancers, and any exercise is better than none. Uh, quit smoking, get vaccinated, and then get these screening tests done to detect the cancers before they spread. Okay, that's all we have for you. Uh, thanks for listening, and if you have any question, questions, there should be an email address. University Radiology offers imaging services to our patients and outside referrals. In addition to traditional x-rays, we offer state-of-the-art imaging technologies for measuring bone mineral density and body mass composition. One of the imaging services in high demand is body composition analysis or BCA. Our simple scan measures a person's total body fat composition as well as the ratio of lean mass to fat mass in each arm and leg, the head and trunk. If you want to stay in good health, this will provide you with a detailed analysis of your body, including measurements of true body fat percentage, ratio of fat to lean tissue, and color-coded body mapping. Because BCA analysis is considered the gold standard in measuring the body composition, people often use the information when planning a workout routine, changing diet, or making a lifestyle makeover. Too much fat can lead to serious health problems like heart disease, diabetes, and joint disorders. Measuring body composition provides a more accurate picture of your overall health than simply stepping on a scale or calculating your body mass index. Many older adults use BCA to keep track of their body fat ratio and markers for obesity. Scans only take a few minutes and use less radiation than you would receive on a commercial flight. One short, simple scan provides a wealth of valuable information about your health. You can map your lean, fat, and bone mass, see real body fat percentage, and identify your risk for metabolic diseases by measuring your visceral adipose tissue. That's the fat on the inside around your organs, not the muffin top that you can pinch. It's a fast and low cost process that does not require a doctor's order and results are available the same day. We invite you to take a new look at your health.
Hi everyone, my name is Lane Heinlein. I'm with the DMU Anesthesia Club and we want to give a presentation on pain journaling and specifically how to do it and why it's helpful. So to kick things off for this pain journaling lecture, um, I wanted to lay out a definition of what pain is. Um, as med students and future physicians, we learn a lot about pain and this is one of the definitions that we've learned. Pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. Um, this is a definition from the International Association for the Study of Pain. I like this definition because it lays out the truth that pain is not just a physical um, symptom. It, it also involves emotional and all these other aspects of life as well. So I think it's important to recognize that as students, medical students, and future physicians, we're being taught that pain is more than just a symptom. Um, when you come in, we understand it has this emotional emotional aspect as well. And so the goals to address pain is to have us, the physician, and you, the patient, work together to resolve this so that we can get you back on your feet and um, hopefully going through life um, back to normal. I think pain journaling is a great way to prepare for doctor visits. Um, it's a helpful tool to keep track of all your pains and experiences and having these details is helpful for when you go into the doctor's office and the nurse or the doctor is taking a history on um, your complaint and often when you have these details it helps get a better history and when the doctor is able to get a better history there's often more confidence in the diagnosis and when there's a more confident diagnosis it's often easier to move forward with the treatment plan and hopefully that all leads to just a better outcome and a better experience for you. As medical students, one of the first things we learn to do is to, how to take a thorough history. The first part of taking a history is called the history of present illness or an HPI. This kind of explores all the details of your chief complaint or why you're visiting. Um, I think it's important that I talk about what we learn and all the questions we learn to ask because that'll help you know what details we're looking for in your pain journaling. So the acronym we use for our HPI is OPQRST. So for the next couple slides, I wanted to walk through what each of these letters mean, and some of the details that they cover so that when you're doing your pain journaling, you can keep these things in mind so that you have answers to the questions that physicians will be asking when you go in for a pain visit. The first letter of our HPI acronym is O, and O stands for onset. One of the first things that you'll be asked when you go in for a pain visit is when did your pain start? Um, was it months ago? Is it a chronic pain? Or is it just in the last week or so, a couple days where it's more acute? Um, this helps the doctor narrow down um, kind of two huge differences between pain, whether that's chronic or acute. And also just having this detail of when it started, if it started with any other um, events in your life is super helpful. The second letter of our HPI acronym is P, and P stands for a number of things, namely palliation, provoke, progression, and previous episodes. So when you're journaling this or keeping track of how your pain, um, what we mean by palliation, is there anything that makes your pain better? When you lie down, does it get better? When you're up walking around or doing things, does it get better? When you're asleep, does it, when you're asleep, does it get better? Anything like that. Um, provoke, does anything make your pain worse? Again, the same things when you're up and walking around, does it get worse? Does it get worse when you're lying down? When you eat food, does it get worse? Um, stuff like that. So anything that makes it better, anything that makes it worse. Progression is also important. So after your onset, how has your pain progressed? Has it gotten worse? Has it gotten better? Has it stayed the same? Off and on, all that sort of thing. In previous episodes, it's sometimes helpful to know if you've had anything like this before. Has this pain, is it similar to an episode that you had three or four years ago? Did it happen a couple months ago? Or maybe it's never happened before at all. It's something completely new. So this is a big piece of the history that I think is very helpful. The next letter in the HPI acronym is Q, and Q stands for quality. This is kind of a subjective topic and it's hard to describe, but when you're journaling your pain, if you can give some adjectives describing it, it's helpful. Um, some adjectives that we hear a lot and are helpful are 
the paint's burning, if it's aching, does it wax and wane? Is it sharp? Is it dull? Is it localized? Um, does it kind of spread out? Just anything is helpful when you're thinking about this, but how would you describe the pain? Put the pain in your own words. The next letter is R, and R stands for region and radiation. Um, another big question that they'll ask, obviously, is where is your pain? So if you're able to point to where it hurts, that's super helpful, obviously. But also something to note is, does it radiate anywhere? Does your pain start at one point and kind of extend to another point in your body? Um, the, the combination of region and radiation along with the um, quality of the pain is very helpful and gives a lot of details to um, what you have going on. The S in acronym stands for severity, and this is another one that's pretty subjective. It's hard to pinpoint down a value on a scale of 1 to 10. So what the doctor would actually find more important is what is the pain keeping you from? Is it keeping you from doing anything in your daily lives that you typically do? Does your pain wake you up at night? Um, just general things like that. It's hard to put it on a scale of this is a 6 pain versus this is a 4 pain, but if you can um, give some details on what it's keeping you from, if it's stopping you from doing anything that's generally more helpful. And the last letter is T, which stands for trauma, treatment, and timing. Um, trauma being, was there a specific event that caused this pain? Did you have a fall? Um, did you get hit by something? Anything like that where the pain was immediately um, or directly caused by that. Treatment, have you been doing anything to treat the pain? Have you been taking medications? Have you had any other therapeutic treatments like chiropractor or heat pad or if you're taking supplements or anything like that? And timing is also really important. Does your pain fluctuate throughout the day? Again, does it wake you up at night? Um, things like that are always helpful to note when you're journaling. A few other things that might be helpful outside of the HPI acronym. Um, or just if you have any accompanying symptoms with your pain. Do you have any nausea, vomiting, diarrhea? Um, have you had any sudden or unexpected weight loss? Um, stuff like that. Anything out of the normal that kind of came along with your pain, kind of presented with it. Another thing to keep track of is any medications you're taking. Um, this includes any supplements, any vitamins, stuff like that, that you're taking daily that doesn't necessarily have to have started taking when your pain started, but just things that help everybody keep track of what you're consuming. So I know that was a really brief introduction into a small piece of the history that we as medical students are learning about, but I thought that that would probably be the best way to show you guys some of the details that we look for when we're asking about pain. So if you know the details that we learn about, then it would be a lot easier for you to journal about them and take that information with you when you go to the doctor. So I hope these few minutes have been helpful. Um, and as always, if you have any questions about pain or different things that you're trying to keep track of, it's always best to call your primary care physician and check with them. So thanks for your time and I hope you have a great rest of the day. Hello everybody, my name is Carly Erlmeyer and I'm the president of Family Medicine Club at DMU and we did our presentation on kidney health and aging. A brief overview of what we'll be talking about today is how your kidneys work, chronic kidney disease, kidney tests to detect disease, and keeping your kidneys healthy. You'll notice in the bottom left hand corner that one in three adults is actually at risk for kidney disease and so it's very important to be aware of this topic. How your kidneys work. Your kidneys are important for the overall function of your body and perform things such as helping to remove waste and excess fluid, filtering your blood, making vitamins, controlling production of red blood cells, regulating blood pressure, and regulating nutrients such as calcium or potassium. So blood enters your kidneys from arteries, and then the blood goes through millions of little filters to be clean. And the bad stuff or the waste moves to the bladder as urine, and then the cleaned blood returns to the bloodstream in your veins. And your, your kidneys filter 
200 quarts of fluid every day. So they do a lot of work for you. Chronic kidney disease. The main causes are diabetes, high blood pressure, and glomerulonephritis. And other causes include polycystic kidney disease, malformations, lupus, obstructions such as kidney stones, or repeated urinary infections. And you'll note that 37 million American adults actually have kidney disease, but don't know it. So some of the symptoms of chronic kidney disease can include feeling more tired than usual or having less energy, having trouble sleeping or trouble concentrating throughout the day, a development of poor appetite, muscle cramping, especially at night, swollen feet and ankles, puffiness around your eyes, especially in the morning, dry, itchy skin, and the need to urinate more often, especially at nighttime. Risk factors for chronic kidney disease include diabetes or high blood pressure, a family history of kidney disease, age 60 or older, or being African American, Hispanic American, Asian, Pacific Islander, or American Indian. And so some of the kidney tests to detect disease include glomerular filtration rate, which is the best way to determine kidney function, urine albumin, blood creatinine, blood pressure, ultrasound or CT scan, and kidney biopsy. And so I'll talk about a few of these in a little bit more detail. The first one I'll talk about is blood creatinine. And so creatinine is a waste product that comes from muscle tissue. And when your kidneys are damaged, they have trouble removing the creatinine from your blood. Those filters that I talked about earlier aren't working as well. Urine albumin is a simple test that checks for albumin, a type of protein in your urine. And so you should not have protein in your urine. It should be in your blood. And so if you have protein in your urine, it can be an early sign of having kidney disease, again, signifying that those filters might not be working well enough. And people with a high amount of albumin in their urine have a higher risk of progressing to kidney failure. The glomerular filtration rate, again, this is the most important test you can do. And it's a measurement calculated from blood creatinine, age, body size, and gender. If your GFR is low, that tells us that your kidneys aren't working as well as they should be. And this helps your doctor stage your disease and plan your treatment. And there are five stages of kidney disease uh, with progressively worse glomerular filtration rate. And then you can see in the chart on the right that your GFR actually does normally decrease with age. And so it's important um, to account for that as well. So how can we prevent kidney disease? There are multiple ways to keep your kidneys healthy. And this includes staying hydrated, eating healthy, controlling your blood pressure and blood sugars, because we talked about how high blood pressure and diabetes are important causes of kidney disease. Be careful with pain relievers. Pain relievers can be pretty tough on the kidneys. And then maintaining a healthy weight. And of course, talk to your doctor at your annual physical about your lifestyle and full health history and make sure um, you don't need to do any of these tests and um, if you do, to order those. Here are the references that we use for this presentation and you can follow the link to a short video from the National Kidney Foundation. Thank you very much. Hey everybody, my name is Katie Harbeck and I am a first year DO student with the DMU Geriatrics Club. First, I just wanted to say how thrilled I am that so many of you are tuning in at home to join us for the 50 and Better Virtual Health Fair. 
Today, I will be discussing how to take care of your eyes and preserve your vision for many years to come. Before we get started, I would like to give you an overview of what we'll be going over today. First, I will be talking about some common eye disorders, most of which you have probably heard of before, but may want to know more about. Then I will be discussing some healthy habits that you can implement in your day-to-day -day life to keep your eyes healthy. Last, we will be talking about some common visual complaints and when they might be a sign of something more serious. The first eye disorder that I'd like to go over is cataract. Most of us have probably heard the term before, so what exactly is a cataract? A cataract is a normal, age-related clouding of the lens. When we are all born, this lens is clear and helps to focus light coming into the eye and create a clear image that the back of the eye can then send to the brain. Just as we all will develop gray hair at some point in our lives, if we live long enough, this lens will become cloudy over time, creating a cataract. In fact, most people have had cataracts or cataract surgery by the age of 80. Cataract surgery takes out the cloudy lens and replaces it with an implantable clear lens in its place. Cataract surgery is generally a very safe procedure and is one of the most common procedures in the US. So how will you know when it's time to have surgery? Some symptoms of progressing cataracts are cloudy or blurry vision. Some will describe this as looking through wax paper. Colors may look faded, and some may seem halos and glare around lights, while others may have difficulty reading road signs from far away. Cataracts may also cause your prescription to change more frequently. And although updating your glasses and contact prescription may help to improve your vision, they can only improve the refractive error and won't help with symptoms like clouding, glares, and halos. If you think you are experiencing some of the symptoms of cataract changes, an ophthalmologist can help you determine if you are a candidate for cataract surgery. The next eye disorder we will be talking about is glaucoma. Glaucoma is a group of eye diseases that cause a problem with the drainage of fluid in the eye, causing a buildup of pressure. Glaucoma can best be described with a bathtub analogy. So if you have a bathtub like the one in this picture here, there are two ways that it can overflow. Either the faucet is on too high or the drain may be clogged. Similarly with glaucoma, either the inside of the eye is producing too much fluid or the area of the eye that drains this fluid becomes blocked. In both situations, Fluid builds up inside the eye and can, can increase the pressure within the eye itself. This increase of pressure can over time damage the cable that carries information from the back of the eye to the brain that we call the optic nerve. Glaucoma is one of the leading causes of blindness in people over 60 and is what we call the theft of sight because it gradually damages the vision in your periphery and most will not notice this damage until the disease has reached an advanced stage. Unfortunately, we do not yet have any way to fix the damage to the optic nerve, so vision loss due to glaucoma is permanent. The good news is your eye care provider can monitor for glaucoma changes in many ways. Most common being a dilated exam, where your doctor can check the health of the nerve in the back of your eye. Your doctor can also take a special picture of the back of your eye that can measure the thickness of the optic nerve itself. Another common test is a visual field test. This tests how much of your peripheral vision you are able to see. So everybody over the age of 60 should be evaluated for glaucoma with a dilated exam. If you have a family history of glaucoma or other risk factors like long-term corticosteroid use such as prednisone, your doctor might want to follow you more carefully. Although glaucoma can seem scary, there are a lot of treatments available, the most common being eye drops. Surgery and minimally invasive in-office laser procedures can also be performed to improve the drainage system in the eye and are effective against glaucoma. Moving on to macular degeneration. Macular degeneration is a thinning of the light-sensitive tissue in the back of the eye called the retina. Macular degeneration specifically causes damage to the part of the retina responsible for central vision. Symptoms of macular degeneration include visual distortions and reduced central vision, which can in turn cause a difficulty in recognizing faces. 
At this time, there is no cure for macular degeneration, but special vitamins can slow the progression of this disease, and low vision resources can help those who are symptomatic improve their day-to-day -day life. Macular degeneration is more common in those over 50, and Caucasian individuals and people with a family history of macular degeneration are also at more risk. Other risk factors include smoking, obesity, and cardiovascular disease. If diagnosed with macular degeneration, your doctor may start you on vitamins that can protect your retina and may have you monitor your vision at home with an ampler grid. As shown below, those who have macular degeneration may see bends or distortions in the grid. The best way to protect your eyes against macular degeneration, especially if you have a family history, is to have regular checkups with your eye doctor. And if you smoke or use other tobacco products, asking your primary care physician to help you quit can be a great way to keep your eyes healthy. The last eye disease I will be talking about is diabetic retinopathy. Anyone with type 1 or type 2 diabetes is at risk for diabetic retinopathy. This risk is greater the longer blood sugar is uncontrolled. Higher blood sugar levels over time can cause damage to the blood vessels that supply the light sensitive tissue in the back of the eye called the retina. These small blood vessels can experience clots and bulges that can leak fluid called microaneurysms. Eventually, if enough blood vessels are damaged, new ones will start to grow that can cause additional problems. Symptoms of diabetic retinopathy include floaters, blurred vision, poor color vision, as well as dark or empty areas in the vision. In addition to improving blood sugar control, treatments for diabetic retinopathy include laser and injections, which both aim to target weak or abnormal blood vessels in the back of the eye. Now that we've talked about some common eye diseases and disorders, it's time to move on to talking about how to protect your eyes. In the next few slides, I will be going over some habits that you can start to help you keep your eyes healthy. Fortunately, many of the things that you can do to improve your overall health are ways that you can also protect and preserve the health of your eyes. This includes getting regular exercise and eating a healthy, balanced diet. A healthy, balanced diet should include a mix of fruits and vegetables, especially leafy green vegetables, as these have nutrients that can nourish your retina. It is also a good idea to reduce the amount of cholesterol in your diet and eat a moderate amount of healthy fats such as omega-3 fatty acids. Foods with omega-3 fatty acids include salmon, tuna, flax seeds, and walnuts. It is best to try and avoid fried and fast foods when possible and limit your intake of processed meats like sausages, bacon, and hot dogs. In addition to diet and exercise, making an appointment with a primary care provider can help you monitor your overall health. For instance, your primary care provider will make sure that your blood pressure is in a safe range. Having high blood pressure can cause damage to the small blood vessels in your body, just like the ones in the back of your eye. If you are a diabetic, it is important to maintain good blood sugar control and have your hemoglobin A1C checked every few months. If you smoke or use tobacco products, asking your primary care provider for ways to help with cessation can be an excellent way to take charge of your overall health and can have added benefits to the health of your eyes. Moving on, we're gonna talk a little bit about eyewear. You should wear sunglasses when outside. Sun exposure can damage your eyes and raise your risk of cataract and age-related macular degeneration. Protect your eyes by using sunglasses that block out 99 to 100% of both UVA and UVB radiation. You should also wear protective eyewear in instances where things might be flying at your face or at your eyes. To prevent eye injury, you need eye protection when playing certain sports, working in jobs such as factory work and construction, and doing repairs or projects around your home. While we are talking about ways to keep your eyes healthy, some of you may have questions about eye vitamins. At some point, all of us have probably walked down an aisle in the grocery store and seen shelves full of endless vitamins, like the picture at the one at the bottom of the slide. This can certainly make it difficult and confusing when trying to decide what vitamins to take. You may have heard about special eye vitamins, like Areds 2. 
ARID stands for Advanced Eye Disease Studies, and it is a supplement that has been shown to help those with diseases like macular degeneration. These vitamins are often prescribed to those with macular degeneration, but may have little benefit to those without the condition. You may be wondering then, what vitamins should I take to protect my eye health? Vitamins can be a great way to supplement your nutrition if you're someone who can't stomach some of the foods we talked about earlier. However, you should always talk to your doctor first before starting new supplements and vitamins, as some vitamins may interfere with medications you may already be taking. Your doctor can also help you determine if you are nutrient deficient and if you need to be taking any supplements. Okay, we just spent the last few minutes discussing ways to keep your eyes healthy. So now, what should you do if you're experiencing some changes in your vision? It is always a good idea to discuss changes in your vision or eye comfort with your doctor. For instance, pain, redness, or a decrease in your vision are all concerns that should be addressed by your eye care provider. In the next few minutes, we will explore some common visual complaints and what steps you can take. Flashes and floaters are a common visual complaint that many older individuals will experience. Everyone's eye is filled with a thick, jelly-like substance called the vitreous. As we get older, this gel starts to clump and pull away from the back of the eye. As it does so, it may tug on that light-sensitive tissue called the retina, and this can cause you to see flashes. The clumping of the gel inside the eye can cause you to see what to some people looks like a fly in their vision. The process of your vitreous clumping and detaching from the back of your eye is a normal process, and your brain will adapt to the floaters over time, and you will notice them less. Although rare, sometimes when the gel pulls away from the back of the eye, it can tug too hard on the retina and cause a tear. Like wallpaper peeling off of a wall, this tear can become bigger and is a sight-threatening emergency. Symptoms of a retinal tear can look like a sudden increase in floaters, almost like you are looking from inside of a snow globe, lots of flashes like a paparazzi is taking pictures of you, or a curtaining in your vision, where part of your vision may seem dark or veiled. Fortunately, if caught soon enough, your doctor can perform surgery to reattach your retina to the back of your eye. Since symptoms of a vitreous detachment and a retinal tear are so similar, anytime you experience new flashes or floaters, it is a good idea to schedule an appointment with your eye care provider as soon as possible. They will be able to perform a dilated exam and determine the cause of your symptoms. The last thing I would like to talk to you all about today is dry eye disease. This is especially important as we are moving into the colder, drier months. We have all probably experienced symptoms of dry eye at some point in our life. This can include a dry, gritty, scratchy feeling, and although it sounds counterintuitive, frequent tearing may also be a sign that your eyes are dry. To understand why our eyes get dry, it helps to get a picture of the surface of our eye. The outer layer of our eye is protected by a coat of our tears called the tear film. As we age, this film may deteriorate for a number of reasons. Fortunately, there are a lot of effective at-home treatments for the symptoms of dry eye. A lot of us right now in our quarantine are spending more time on our screens and reading than we may have in the past. When we look at things up close for long periods of time, we tend to blink less. And blinking allows us to coat the surface of our eyes with a fresh tear film. One way we can improve the comfort of our eyes while reading and doing computer work is using the 20-20-20 rule. Or every 20 minutes you spend doing up-close work, you should look away and focus on something around 20 feet away from you for 20 seconds and remember to blink. Staying hydrated is another great way to keep your eyes healthy. It is recommended that you drink 8 to 10 glasses of water a day. Artificial tears can be found over the counter at the drugstore and basically act like lotion for the surface of your eyes. A few drops throughout the day can help lubricate your eyes. Just be sure to avoid drops that say get the red out as these may cause more damage to the surface of your eyes over time. During the cold winter months when the air is drier, 
Using a humidifier inside the home or office can be very helpful, especially if you work in places where vents may be blowing dry air in your face. Another great at-home remedy for dry eyes is warm compressing. You can use a warm washcloth or even warm eye compresses that you can buy over the counter at the drugstore. These can help warm up the oil glands in your eyelids and can improve the tear foam that coats your eyes. If you are still bothered with symptoms of dry eye after trying these at-home remedies, your doctor may be able to perform in-office treatments to relieve some of your dry eye symptoms. Before we finish up, I would like to review some important take-home messages that we talked about today. You should always talk to your doctor about new or worsening visual concerns. It's a good idea to follow up with your primary care physician to monitor your overall physical health. And you should schedule an annual dilated exam with your eye doctor. For glaucoma patients specifically, you should always take eye drops as instructed. If you have difficulty taking drops or if they're too expensive, you should talk to your doctor as they may be able to find a better solution. Thank you so much for tuning into our presentation on eye health. I hope you enjoy the rest of the virtual 50 and better health fair and that you have a wonderful rest of your day. If you would like additional information on what I talked about in this presentation, I have included a page here of my references for your convenience. Hello everyone, my name is Mandy Hill. I'm a second year medical student. Um, and I'm here today to talk to you about um, end of life decision making. We're going to be talking a little bit about um, different advanced directives that are available for you, as well as different ways to get your wishes for uh, your end of life decisions out there and known. Um, so without further ado, let's go ahead and get into it. So first, I just have some links here for the IPOST. Um, it stands for the Iowa Physician Orders for Scope of Treatment. And unfortunately, you can't click the links, but um, we have the document here. It's one page front and back, and it's broken up into four sections. So the first is CPR. The second is medical interventions. The third is artificially administered nutrition. And the fourth is medical decision making. And I am but a lowly medical student, but I'm joined with Dr. O'Shea, who has much more experience talking about these forms. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to her. All right. So thank you. Um, so the IPOST document uh, has been in existence probably for about 10 years in the state of Iowa, and it's actually similar documents are available across the country. What I'd like to do is go to each box and, and just kind of enlighten you on what those mean. So in A, when you're t thinking about CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, this is when somebody is going to be giving you uh, compressions on your chest. We usually don't do that until you've stopped breathing. Well, until you've stopped breathing, uh, and your heart has stopped. We check your pulse. We check your breathing first before we do any, do any of that. What you need to know is you, except in children, when you get to that point, there's a lot of things that's already wrong with your heart and lungs. So that doing CPR doesn't restore you back to the way you were when you were 20 or 25 years of age like Mandy is. It doesn't even restore you to the way you were a month or two ago, but the way you were 20 minutes or 30 minutes or an hour ago. So you do need to realize CPR might bring your heart back to work, but it doesn't help with the, the illness that brought you to that situation. So let's move on to B. When we're talking about medical interventions, this person has a pulse, is breathing, but has, is in a situation where they are at the end of their life. So if you are in that situation and all you want is comfort measures, that's what to, uh, to check. That doesn't mean we stop caring for you. We always care. But what we will do for you is to relieve your pain and suffering, but not do anything that is necessarily going to be uncomfortable for you. Um, no life-sustaining treatments. If you were, had previously had, had cancer, this would mean 
not doing any additional chemotherapy that is curative. Anything that palliates and takes pain away would also be included under comfort measures. Now, the limited ad additional interventions, this is important to think about. If you would want something like IV antibiotics in case you got pneumonia, it's important to know that that would be part of the limited inter uh, interventions. They would also potentially uh, give you medicines that might help your heart uh, short of doing um, more of full treatment. Uh, so that could be medicines like um, and anything that would support your heart or support your breathing that's short of that. That may also include some uh, respiratory support that is called BiPAP or CPAP that is even used now in COVID to support your respiratory uh, symptoms and keep you away from the mechanical ventilation. Finally, full treatment includes everything we've already talked about, but that means you have the tube go down your throat, uh, the cardioversion, the electrical stimulation of your heart would also be, be done. So you do need to understand what those means. And if you have any questions, please talk to your primary care physician about it. The third one is about artificially administered nutrition. If you choose, to, this is not a tube necessarily that goes down your throat um, through your nose. That usually is only done for a few days or hours, uh, let's say if you had some stomach surgery. But we're talking more about what's called a gastrostomy tube, a, uh, a tube that goes through the skin of your abdomen directly into your stomach. And there are times when a trial period of a tube is, is certainly warranted. I've had patients who've had some damage to their airway from an injury or an infection and needed two to three months of a tube. That's certainly indicated. And be thinking about that as you, you check that box. But most of the patients that I deal with have long-term artificial nutrition by tube. This might be a patient with a neurodegenerative disease like Lou Gehrig's disease or ALS, or it could be someone that had a stroke that affected their ability to swallow and they'll never be able to get that back. Those are the patients that have the long-term gastrostomy too. Finally, we're uh, moving to D. What she, this is helping you to decide who is going to be your surrogate. If you are unconscious, unable to, to um, list who you, who you want to make decisions for you, or if you are demented and the dementia is ad, advanced enough, you cannot speak for yourself. After you, you need to designate who would speak for you. The best, always the best person for that is going to be whoever you designate as your durable power of attorney. And that can be your spouse, but if your spouse is your same age and you're in your 80s, you may want to decide that one of your adult children or a sibling could be your durable power of attorney. Certainly, that's something to talk to a lawyer about. And then on the other side of D is the rationale for these orders. If this is acting as your advanced directives, that's great. If you know you have poor prognosis or limited treatment options and you want your healthcare providers, including the EMTs and paramedics that might be picking you up from your home if you're acutely ill. This is important to fill this out. And the reason why we have it in a bright color, a salmon color is what is suggested, is that you take your original of this and post it at your house uh, somewhere, usually I say hang it on the refrigerator. And when you look at the opposite page, the other person that needs to sign this in order for this to be a valid medical order for the EMT, for the paramedic to follow all these directions, it does need to be signed by a healthcare professional that's at the bottom of the, the other side. And I suggest you review it on a regular basis with your primary care physician and your durable power of attorney. You can always revise it, but it's a good idea to go just above the healthcare professional's signature and say, we reviewed it today, today's date is, and do that every six to 12 months. By the way, the people that can help you do this, it could be an MD or DO, it could be a PA or physician assistant, 
and it could be a nurse practitioner or an NP. Why don't you take it back, Mandy? Excellent. So the next form that we're going to be talking about is the five wishes. So um, I've included some links here on how to find the five wishes document, but unfortunately because this is a PowerPoint, you can't necessarily click them. But uh, I've included some pictures of what the front cover looks like as well as the pricing options for the Five Wishes Advanced Directive. So it's $5. There's an online PDF version which you fill out on your computer or a physical paper copy that you can fill out um, on paper with a pen. Um, it comes in, I believe, 29 different languages. And uh, here at DMU we have, I think, 15 copies uh, in English. Uh, for y'all to uh, have access to. We also have two Spanish copies if English isn't your first language. Um, and I've also included a picture of the front cover. So the way that the five wishes operates is it's broken down into five different sections of your different end of life decision making like uh, decisions, I guess. So the first wish is the person I want to make care decisions for me when I can't. The second wish is the kind of medical treatment I want or don't want. The third wish is how comfortable I want to be. The fourth wish is how I want people to treat me. And the fifth wish is what I want my loved ones to know. So where this one is really great is it doesn't just take into account like what medical procedures you want done. It also takes into account the more humanistic aspects of the dying process. So, you know, how many people and who you want around you when you're dying. Um, there's another option in there that's about like if you want oils rubbed on your body while you're dying, um, different music that you want to listen to as well. Um, and I think it's just really phenomenal to have those more personal aspects of the dying process addressed when it normally isn't. Um, do you have anything else to add, Dr. O'Shea? Sure. What I do want you to know is that numbers one and two are very similar to the iPost document, but you really should have both because the iPost document is a doctor's orders for other healthcare professionals to follow. But having the five wishes filled out also helps your family a lot to have a document that, that they can hold on to. And what I love about three, four, and five is it really expands, uh, the booklet expands on what comfort wishes are. Um, and number four talks about things that beyond just physical comfort, things you discussions you might want to be having with your family um, as the physical touch, which we, we can still hear and we can still feel things even if we cannot communicate back to, to our loved ones. And finally, uh, I think everyone should, should review number five, which is things that you all want your family, your loved ones to know, um, including receiving and giving forgiveness, to know how much you've loved them, things that you might want to share or have shared uh, at your memorial service or funeral. So I, I, I highly, I wish you would embrace the five wishes. Uh, and um, of course you can purchase them through either the booklet or online. But again, if we've got your name and email address and, and personal address, uh, our limited copies. We have some limited copies, but we can certainly send them out. Yeah, and Thanks. I'll talk a little bit more about that towards the end of the PowerPoint. Um, so now, um, as far as the advanced directives go, this is something which um, you need to meet with a healthcare provider about. For the durable power of attorney, you need to meet with a lawyer about. Um, but I've included some links here, um, of which unfortunately you can't click, um, to various documentations for the different advanced directives. Um, Mercy One and any hospital have, you know, people that are available to help you fill out this paperwork, which I think is awesome. Um, it's very empowering um, in order to fill out this paperwork and to have someone to help you with it because it can be very long and daunting. <laughs> but yeah. And then um, here is just kind of some more information about the different advanced directives and the ones that Iowa law recognizes. Um, again, Mercy One is uh, the one hospital that I was able to find a lot of information on, but any hospital will be able to help you with this documentation and to uh, provide people to go through it with you. Um, so uh, the last little bit of our PowerPoint presentation is 
who you can go to if you have more questions. So of course, any primary care provider or any member of the healthcare team will be able to help you with these end of life decision making uh, forms or advanced directives. Um, if you go to them and ask them questions, um, spouse, family and friends are great people to talk to to have your wishes known. Um, because unless we don't talk about it, you know, we'll never be able to quite know specifically what you want for your end of life process. And religious leaders can be a great source for what you want done to your body spiritually while you're dying. Um, or if you have any questions about the dying process and a spiritual aspect. Uh, do you have anything to add to that, Dr. O'Shea? Okay, so the one thing I want you to know is every hospital since about 1995 is will ask you about your advanced directives at the time of admission to the hospital. It's not necessarily because they believe that you might pass away during that time, but they are obligated to ask you as part of your patient, the Patient Self-Determination Act of the mid-1990s. So they, every hospital will do that, um, but don't wait till you, a hospitalization. Talk to your primary care provider earlier than that and make sure that not only do you have a copy of the, those physician orders, but make sure that your primary care uh, provider has that, as well as the hospital that you would designate as the one you want to be taken to if, if you couldn't just speak for yourself. Excellent. Thank yeah. you. Um, and that concludes our presentation. I've included some references of uh, different organizations that we've talked about today, and I also threw in the uh, AARP link. They have awesome resources for end of life decision making, as well as just resources in general about the aging process. Um, and finally, this is my email. Um, if you have any desire to have any of these forms that we've talked about today, or if you have any more questions about end of life decision making, please don't hesitate to email me. Um, if you're emailing to get an end of life decision making form, like the iPost or the Five Wishes, uh, send me your uh, home address or where you get mail regularly and we can send that your way. Um, thank you so much for listening to our presentation. We really appreciate it. It's not easy to think about and talk about mortality, but we really appreciate you taking the time and being here with us today. At the Des Moines University Clinic Osteopathic Manual Medicine Department, our physicians treat a full range of health conditions according to our different specialties. We integrate osteopathic manipulative medicine into a wide range of backgrounds and trainings, including family medicine, internal medicine, pediatrics, rehabilitation medicine, and neuromusculoskeletal medicine. Osteopathic Manual Medicine, or OMM, is a hands-on, non-invasive way to assess and treat the structure of the body to improve the function of all systems in the body. DMU's osteopathic physicians assess the structure of the body for twists and turns in the body's framework that can either contribute to or altogether cause your original disease or illness, even injury. These twists and turns are diagnosed and treated by the physician's own hands. Some examples of conditions we treat include adults with chronic illnesses in breathing, digestion, sinus infections, needing help healing after surgery, nerve damage, diseases of the spine, and migraine headaches. We even treat pregnant patients and babies. OMM allows the body to function more efficiently, supporting the ability to fight off disease and more easily recover from illness, injury, or surgery. DMU's clinicians provide thorough consultations to patients to address illness and symptoms that may not be helped by conventional treatment. We invite you to give our clinic a call if you're looking for a physician who can help you get to the root cause of your illness or injury. We're here to help. At Des Moines University Clinic, you'll find healthcare professionals with only one priority, you, the patient. Come see us for the very best in family medicine, physical therapy, podiatric medicine, and osteopathic manual medicine. Call today to schedule an appointment.
We've reached the portion, the, the question and answer portion of our virtual uh, uh, 50 and Better Health Fair today. And we've got uh, several students and Dr. Tracy Porter's with us as well to answer a few of the questions uh, that were submitted. Um, I'll kick it off. Uh, the question I have or was given to me is uh, some of my medications get me stopped up and constipated. Is it all right to take a stool softener or a laxative or not? So uh, obviously any serious constipation, constipation that causes uh, pain, uh, vomiting, uh, other serious symptoms, those you should go to your primary care provider about. But if it's just a problem of hard stools and difficulty having a bowel movement, um, oftentimes, some, uh, oftentimes some type of stool softener is a good idea. Now there's a difference between stool softeners and laxatives. Laxatives are actually stimulants that make you go Stool softeners are more materials that help uh, keep moisture within the stool and help keep the stool softer so that it's easier to go. <clears throat> so some examples of stool softeners uh, would be brands like Metamucil, uh, Miralax, Citrusel. You may have heard of, of several of those and there are generic versions. You should ask your pharmacist about that. They'll be very helpful. But these are materials that, that aren't habit forming. Your intestines don't get hooked on them or anything like that. They just help keep moisture and softness in the stool. If you really need help to, to go and stool softeners aren't enough, that's where you would pick a laxative. And some laxative brands you might have heard of would be uh, Milk of Magnesia, 
Uh, there's one called Dolcalax. Again, consult with your pharmacist and they can, uh, they can point those out to you. Those should be used rarely, however, because your intestines can sort of get, uh, get used to those medications and actually require them uh, to have a normal stool. Uh, your pharmacist can be very helpful in issues like this. And of course, talking with your primary care provider uh, uh, can be helpful as well. Well, I think uh, uh, Dr. Porter's had some questions. Uh, uh, she's a doctor of physical therapy in our physical therapy department. Dr. Porter? Thank you, Dr. Volker. Um, yes, I had some questions submitted to the physical therapy department related to fall prevention as well as urinary incontinence, so I'll be addressing those questions. So one of the questions that came in about fall prevention is what might be included in a physical therapy evaluation if a patient has issues with balance or a history of falling? And so I'll try to make this brief because the evaluation is pretty comprehensive, but Really, we start with a good history, and so we will be asking you a lot of targeted questions to find out about the frequency of falls you may have experienced, what types of activities challenge your balance the most, how confident you feel with your balance, because there's a lot of predictive um, relationship between your confidence and risk of falling. We'll also then uh, try to determine through our exam, really look at all the different elements that need to work together to uh, have good balance and, and to avoid falling. And so we'll uh, screen your inner ear function to make sure there's nothing going on with your inner ear that might be contributing to your lack of balance or your falling. We'll definitely spend a lot of time looking at your range of motion and your muscular strength, uh, as well as your sensation, because all of those things are very important to maintaining balance and to avoiding falls. Um, and then through that examination, we may also decide to uh, perform some outcomes measures. And those are some research-based tools that can actually be predictive of falls and can be very useful in setting goals. So maybe if you have a certain score that says you're at a moderate risk for falls, through our interventions, then we'll continue to monitor that. And our goal would be that we would get you at the level that you would be at a low risk or no uh, minimal risk for falling. And so really it's a pretty comprehensive process that involves um, getting a little bit of information about your fall history, and then examining all of the elements that contribute to balance and make sure that they're all working optimally. And whatever ones need a little bit of uh, intervention, we'll prescribe appropriate movement to help you improve those areas. Um, kind of along with that, another question that had come in is, is how can PT reduce my fall risk? And so I've already answered that a little bit, but Again, certainly by giving you some education on environmental safety things you can do. So if you have throw rugs or cords or pets, sometimes we can uh, just give you some education about how to make your environment safer. We can certainly also, if necessary, help you identify a good assistive device and make sure that device is fit properly to you if that would be something that would improve your balance. And then as I mentioned, we can prescribe very targeted exercises and movement interventions to address the areas that might uh, need a little bit of improvement. Uh, I'll go ahead and, and go on then to a couple of questions that came in regarding urinary incontinence. And actually, uh, I am just currently participating in some more continuing education in this topic. So great timing for this, these questions to come in. Uh, so one of the questions that came in was, can a physical therapist help with all types of incontinence? And whoever submitted this question must know quite a bit to even know that there are multiple types. But the two main types, the two most common types are urge incontinence and stress incontinence. Urge incontinence, some of the symptoms, if you have that issue, might be that you um, have sudden and intense urges to use the restroom and maybe have difficulty getting to the bathroom on time. Uh, symptoms of stress incontinence that a patient might experience would be that leakage of urine when maybe you're coughing or sneezing or doing some type of impact activity. And then there are many other types of incontinence as well. And sometimes a patient is dealing with multiple types. And so a physical therapist, again, can provide education. For example, for urge incontinence, we talk about um, a, a voiding log. How often are you going? Can we retrain your bladder to, feel, uh, to not feel full so quickly? Also, in terms of your fluid intake, are you um, taking in things that might be irritating to your bladder? And those can really contribute to that urgency, such as caffeine, alcohol, carbonation, citrus juices. Um, so we talk about those types of things in terms of urge incontinence. And then for stress incontinence, we're really looking at your pelvic floor strength. And many of you have probably heard of kegels, uh, but what we know is that a kegel doesn't mean the same thing to everybody. And it can be a challenging exercise to do. I don't know if any of you have ever tried, but uh, a physical therapist can really examine your pelvic floor strength 
and make sure that you're activating the correct muscles and then give you again a very uh, prescribed and individualized exercise program to help improve the strength and the function of the pelvic floor. Uh, the last question that came in about incontinence that I'll address then is just what are some of the risk factors? So incontinence can happen for a variety of reasons. Some of the risk factors for stress incontinence can be age. Um, as our hormones change, as we go through menopause, the tissues in that area become a little less uh, healthy and, and can be more at risk for some of that dysfunction and that, and that stress leakage of urine. Uh, certainly any pelvic trauma, so this could be a pelvic surgery, uh, pregnancy and delivery, any of those things can certainly be risk factors. Um, chronic coughing, so sometimes I've seen patients who maybe have uh, chronic bronchitis, and, and because of that constant coughing and pressure on the pelvic floor, they've developed some trauma to those muscles. So that, those are some of the risk factors. The other risk factors can be a little bit behavioral. And so an example of that is, and this is common, if a woman starts, or man, starts to experience some leakage of urine, one of our natural tendencies is to maybe not drink as much because we think if we just don't drink as much, we won't have this issue. And what can happen over time is then the urine becomes more concentrated, uh, that irritates the bladder, and that just leads to increased urgency. And now we've kind of got a stress incontinence issue and urge incontinence you know, happening at once. I know, I'm sure Dr. Volker could attest to this and the students as well who are very busy, that another risk factor is just not being intentional about drinking enough water and, and going to the bathroom on a reasonable schedule. And so I've definitely had days where I realized, oh my, it's been six hours. I probably had two sips of water and I haven't made a trip to the bathroom. And so some of it can just be uh, being preventative and making sure that you're, you're taking care of yourself and that you're allowing time for proper fluid intake and then uh, proper use of the bathroom. All right, I will take it over from here. So the question that was submitted to me was, I'm having trouble with my toenails and I just can't get down there to cut them. And I also think my feet are getting some sores on them. Any ideas of what I should do? So an important thing to remember with sores on the bottom of your feet is that it's very important to get an appointment with either your primary care physician or a foot and ankle doctor called a podiatrist. We are lucky here at DMU because we have both options in the same building. Sores on the bottom of your feet, especially if you can't feel them, are an indicator of diabetes, which is why it's important to see someone as soon as you notice them. The urgency comes from the fact that since you can't feel them, they could be much more worse than what you thought, and it can take longer to heal properly without a trained physician's help. Podiatrists also have extra training to assist you with those tricky toenails and would happy, happy, happy to help as well. Okay, and I'll take the next question. So the question submitted to me is, I hear all these commercials on TV about medications that help with your memory and keeping you sharp, but they are rather expensive. Are they worth it or is there anything else I can do to keep my mind sharp? So this is a great question. And before I answer it, I definitely recommend speaking with your doctor before starting anything new, because like any medications, these could cause other unwanted side effects and potentially interact with the medications you're already taking. So just to be safe, touch base with your physician before you buy any medications. But fortunately, there are numerous evidence-based ways to improve your memory naturally. So just to start off, it's important to maintain good general health. So follow a healthy diet, exercise regularly, refrain from smoking, maintain low blood pressure, cholesterol, and blood sugar. Mental exercise is another great way to keep the brain sharp and maintain um, memory tone. So the best activities are the ones that engage different parts of your brain simultaneously and in a challenging way. So for example, you could play an instrument, try to learn a new language, or paint. Brain games can also be a fun way to engage the brain and improve memory. For instance, you could do crossword puzzles, chess, regular puzzles, um, and anything that you feel stimulates your brain in a challenging way. So yes, there may be medications out there that claim to help with memory, but there are so many other things that we can do to keep us mentally sharp in a natural way. So definitely consider these and reach out to your physician if you feel inclined to purchase some of these medications you're seeing on TV. And I will pass it along to Kayla next. Hi, so the question that I received was, what should I do if I think I have COVID? And so the CDC and coronavirus.iowa.gov have recommendations for both if you were exposed and if you develop symptoms that are similar to that of COVID. So if you've been exposed but are currently asymptomatic, you should stay in your home and quarantine for 14 days following the exposure. 
If you live with others, you should wear a mask to limit the spread and do not share dishes, utensils, drinking glasses, towels, or bedding. If you live with others, it is also important to clean and disinfect common high touch areas on a daily basis. It is especially important to stay away from those who are at a higher risk for getting very sick from COVID, such as our older, uh, our older peers and those who are immunocompromised as well. If you have any currently scheduled doctor's appointments that absolutely cannot be rescheduled, it's important to call them right away and inform them of your exposure so that they can discuss safety options with you or if there's any alternatives that you guys can explore. You should be vigilant about monitoring your symptoms in the meantime. If you do develop symptoms such as fever or cough, you should call your regular healthcare provider right away and follow their directions very closely. While waiting for an office visit or test results, you should stay home and physically separate yourself from other people and animals in your home. You should be sure to cover your coughs and wash your hands frequently in the meantime. And if you experience any emergency warning signs such as trouble breathing, chest pain, any new confusion, inability to stay awake, bluish discoloration to your face or lips or any other concerning symptoms, you should seek emergency medical care immediately. And again, it's also important that you call ahead with information regarding your COVID exposure or your concerns that you may have COVID so that they are, that they are ready to take care of you in a way that is safe for you while decreasing risk of transmission for staff and other patients. So I will pass it along to Katie, who I believe has the next question. Yep, thank you, Kayla. Um, and my question is also about COVID. So the question that was submitted to me is, is it safe to see our family at Thanksgiving this year? When we all get together, there are 17 of us, and we have been so careful with the virus. We don't want to miss out on this time, but want to be safe too. Wow, and I think that's a question that so many of us are having right now. Unfortunately, the fun holiday activities that we enjoy most, like gathering with loved ones and eating together, may be some of the higher risk scenarios for transmitting COVID-19, especially if members of your family are at greater risk, like older adults or those who have um, serious underlying medical conditions. So right now, staying home is the best way to protect yourself and others. And so although COVID may be limiting what a safe gathering looks like this year, the choice to celebrate and how you celebrate is still a personal one. So some lower risk options could include having a small dinner with only people who live in your direct household. You could prepare traditional meals for family and neighbors that are higher risk and deliver them in a way that doesn't involve contacting others. You could have a virtual dinner and share recipes instead of meals with friends and family. And shopping online will be better than um, shopping in person this year. Likewise, watching sporting events, parades, and movies from home is going to be the safest way to enjoy these activities. The bottom line is, getting creative this year will be the best way to protect your loved ones while still making new memories. And so I will pass it on to Claire and she'll be answering some of your questions on exercise. So the question I received is why is exercise so important even if it is minimal? As many of you probably know, exercise is really beneficial for keeping our body and mind healthy. Some of the key benefits we can get from exercise are improved healing, prevention of disease, increased balance and flexibility, and improved quality of life. The main types of exercise include endurance, strength, balance, and flexibility. It is never too late to start exercising and even a little bit of exercise can go a long way. However, if you haven't been very active in the past, it is, it is important to slowly work up to your exercise goal. You do not wanna overstrain yourself and cause an injury that could prevent you from working out or also prevent you from doing your daily activities. You can start small by doing something like trying to stand up every hour and take at least 200 steps, just trying to get your blood and your muscles moving. But um, really you should contact your primary healthcare provider to figure out what types of exercise are gonna work best for you. Thank you, Claire, and everyone for answering the questions that were submitted by the public today. But it looks like that's all the time we have for questions. Well, I want to thank Dr. Porter and all the student doctors who joined today for putting this all together. We're really happy you were able to join us for our first ever virtual 50 and Better Health Fair. We're interested in your feedback on this, and so if uh, if you if you can take just a minute or two and fill out a survey, that'll help us to know how, what a job we did and what we might be able to do better in the future. The uh, survey is hopefully being displayed on your screen, but it's at www.dmu.edu 
slash health fair survey, all one word. If you'd be able to fill that out, we'd greatly appreciate it. Uh, I want to invite any of you who uh, may have health care needs and remind you that uh, at the uh, Des Moines University clinics, we have a physical therapy clinic, a foot and ankle clinic, an osteopathic medicine clinic, and a general family medicine clinic. And we're always available to help serve you both in person uh, and uh, over, uh, over the computer, over telehealth if that's necessary. Everybody stay safe. Enjoy your, uh, enjoy your autumn, and we look forward to seeing you again, hopefully in person, a year from now.